how uh, how how's the quarantine treating you guys? How's lockdown? I'm not too bad. I don't go out too much as it is. <laughs> yeah. How are you coping with it? Oh, you know, it's a real treat. I love being scared of getting laid because it might kill my parents. That's that's a blast. Uh, <laughs> That that's it's a lot of fun being scared of touching cardboard. It, I love washing my hands every five fucking minutes. You know. <laughs> yeah, my hands are like an eight-year-old hands now. The oh I've god, them. cracking like crazy. <laughs> yeah. I have a fucking walking around with the fucking mask everywhere. It's a real <laughs> no. Life's a treat, you know. <laughs> and then and then and then of course you know half half the fucking city's been fucking trashed. So that's great too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. know if it's just the news we get over here, but you must be the only American who's abiding by the lockdown. I think. Well, at this point, uh, basically, it really depends on the city you're in. Yeah. So you have half the country does not give a shit anymore. They're just they're just <laughs> done. And I mean, they're gonna have the fucking Trump rallies, and you know, there's obviously there's the big protests, which you know the cops in America are real shit, but. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't want all these fucking people to 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 die. So you know that that's that's where I get I get a little wigged out. Yeah. Because I do I do I am worried about the long term. But you guys had your own shit. You had like a bunch of Boris Johnson's guys running around, yeah. right? While, while he was <laughs> yeah. His son, he got this sick. weekend. Yeah, and then this weekend. Well, not just the the. But didn't you have like the 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 guy the second in command? Yeah. Yeah, he's fucking around. <laughs> so. that's... <laughs> We, we've got it great. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where are you guys all in the same city? Yeah. So yeah, we're like Cheltenham. It's kind of Cheltenham or Gloucester. It's like hard to explain. It's, horse racing is the big thing round by us, and then other than that, we're about a couple of hours from London, so not really near anywhere significant. Oh, well, that's okay. I mean, I you know, I I, I live in near Hollywood, but I, I grew up in the suburbs, so I'm I'm constantly driving back and forth a half hour. Uh, you know, because, uh, well, my parents have a nicer place than I do. So, <laughs> yeah. Always the way. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. And and then I just, uh, that, that, it's pretty much the only people I really see are my mom, my dad, my grandma. Sometimes I'll, like, hang out with somebody, like, outdoors with, like, I, I like, set up this table so I don't get, get too close. But, uh, <laughs> you know, and that, but that, and that's a real treat. And then, you know, I, I dumped my girlfriend in February, so... It was actually perfect timing because we would have <laughs> fucking murdered each other. <laughs> like we were living together for two years, going on, and, and and oh man, that would have been, that would have been real, real gnarly. So we all, it all, everything is, you know, look, look, I think we got probably another three to six months more of this bullshit, and then we'll probably be done. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, I am like a total basket case. So I'm like, I am very, very, very strict, much more strict than than. <laughs> And I think it's, you know, my grandma's 95, my parents are in their 60s, and I see them a lot. So, like, that's, so, like, besides going to the store and getting, like, pick up, it's about it. Just basic, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you guys are, uh, so do you guys, where you guys, you guys all live in the same town. Have you guys seen each other in a few months, or is this mainly, mainly it? No, this, this has been it already, yeah. Is. I know, dude. Yeah. You guys been doing movie nights, playing video games, yeah. anything like that? Well, that's we started this. Um, like we usually just talked about sports, but then everything got cancelled. So we started this, and it was kind of a good excuse to rewatch all of these films. Oh yeah, and, and it's a good list. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, kind of as I messaged you, so it's, it's worked out well in a way because we've managed to get some of your time. But Project X was one of our favourites. One that we we did an episode on it um, a couple of weeks back. Oh no, shit! So, send it over to me. Yeah, I'd like well, to. I'll, I'll hear that. So, uh, I mean, it's, thank you for giving us some of your time. It was just kind of chat about the film, and then you, you, in, you in particular, like the the films that we've got, your opinion on them, and all sorts. See where we go. Well, my my whole thing is, uh, <clears throat> and and they're not getting made right now, unfortunately. But my bread and butter has always been middle brow comedies, the shit that is dumb enough for dumb people to like, but smart enough for smart people to like too. That it, it, it's you know. You can you can have it both ways, and I feel like comedy, the state of comedy, especially because everything's streaming, is 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 
honestly, it's a lot of sad comedy, and I just don't <laughs> like sad comedy that much. I yeah. like dark comedy. I like fucked up stuff, but I don't like you know, like I don't want to watch a fucking crying horse, uh, and that's I feel like the <laughs> the world we're in right now. So. About Project X, look, I mean, first of all, it's crazy that you guys picked that over Borat. Like, look, I love the movie. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm obviously I'm attached to it because I was in it, but uh, Borat's better. So you guys are wrong. Um, it's one of the greatest movies of all time. But look, uh, Project X, right? So, so we shot that, I guess, nine years ago at this point, which is nuts, and it came out eight years ago. And um, you know, it's interesting because it had this impact. And it's an impact that doesn't really exist online, if that makes any sense. Like, critics fucking hated it. Um, <laughs> movie, kind of like on all the movie nerd websites, it's kind of not really, nobody ever talks about it. But I still get, a, you know, I still get approached about it pretty frequently. So it, it has an impact. And, and, um, and and I'm, I'm I'm proud of that. It was fun to be a part of it. I'm, you know, it was a different. When I say when I was telling you, Luke, is a different part of my yeah. life. It's because I do a lot more writing now, and I still like to act, but um, I, I've really shifted to more like behind behind the camera work, and uh, so so that's that's really what I meant by it. Um, yes. But but you know, it's interesting when you spend three months basically essentially partying from like <laughs> 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And, and you know it's it's it was it was this real interesting moment in my life because the way they cast this film was was very non-traditional they didn't do um your typical audition they had people send in videos uh describing you know crazy parties and crazy moments and I grew up my whole life as an extreme introvert. I had no social skills. And I mean, you could argue I still don't, but I've gotten a lot better at it. And and so just being immersed with so many people uh, was like a real crash course in, in, in sort of becoming a much more extroverted person, which I would say I am now. Uh, and, and so it was it was really kind of amazing going from somebody who, I, I, I was doing a lot of stand-up comedy at the time, and uh, I didn't really, besides like, you know, doing like Fiddler in the Roof in sixth grade, there wasn't a lot of acting going on. And so I, I credit it with sort of giving me this this boost for a few years. And, and you know, there's a lot of work until I stopped being fat. And then that, that kind of went to, to shit. They wanted, the system is fucked up, man. Uh, but, uh, you know, being being like sort of this this pudgy dude, and and sort of being thrown in this situation where you're just surrounded by, you know, it's interesting because it wasn't obviously a real party, but it really did feel like it. I mean, there were moments that were kind of funny, like when people were dancing to thump tracks where there was no actual music being played, but you had to like <laughs> pretend there was music being played. But like, you know, we had hundreds of extras and they were all getting fucked up for real. The studio <laughs> turned a blind eye to that. We were not allowed to get fucked up, but yeah. Like, the extras there, you had so many people, and, and then they threw parties on the weekends too, and that was just—I mean, it was just a wild time. Uh, Nima Norizada, the director, he's the coolest. I'm not really tight with the producers or the studio or some of the actors anymore, but working with Nima was a real blast, um, and and it was just—it was so much fun to sort of just be involved in this thing because it was constantly changing. Uh, the script was sort of amorphous. You know, we had the beats of, you know, getting the party starting, the party, you know, getting crazier and crazier than the riots at the end, which, you know, some of the imagery, uh, part of the reason I think the critics were freaked out was because there was such a willful disregard for property. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously the situation is much more serious going on right now. But like I saw these weird things where like I saw a guy steal a police horse uh on, on video and like the the news like a week ago and i said oh i remember that shit like so it's kind of funny but but okay so in terms of making the movie what do you guys want to know well it's, it's funny you should say about the critics kind of first of all because yeah we've been chatting about this the last couple of weeks and saying it's strange that the same people that critique say shawshank redemption are the same people that then go and give their opinion on American Pie 2. And so yeah. 
the com- the critic aspect for comedies is so strange because you're asking kind of the same people to judge things they may not be a fan of. We looked at some of the reviews for Project X and there's such a kind of difference between on Rotten Tomatoes they have the critic reviews and the audience reviews and uh-huh. they're like polar opposites when mm. you look at the two of them. Yeah. Oh, it's like The Last Jedi, right? I mean, you just have these kind of <laughs> moments where people are just not on the same page. Part of the issue uh, with critics nowadays is because they're all competing on the, the, the tomato meter and yeah. there's, this, there's this pressure to not be an outlier. So, you know, you don't see a lot of movies on Rotten Tomatoes anymore that get like, mixed reviews because these critics are all friends with each other and they're Mm -hmm. all trying to basically be on the same page there's just peer pressure and part of that it 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 comes from yeah professional networking it also comes from the fact that everyone's competing for like that you know when you go on the tomato meter and you see that one sentence that the critics are trying to use to get people to click and so that has to be more and more intense and inflammatory uh, critics are a lot meaner than they used to be. A lot meaner. <laughs> like, I mean, there was one critic who wrote like that the actors. I remember when this came out. Like this critic who said like like the actors should be shot. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck? And that guy ended up living in my fucking building. So that was a real treat. Uh, yeah, I, I, this this guy who ran this this website called Badass Digest. He was like tweeting about me all the time he hated the movie so much the fat kid from project x is having a girl over it was fucking creepy <laughs> but anyway he got me too so <laughs> we thought the reviews were harsh for project x and then we watched back um that's my boy with adam sandler um two weeks ago and that came out the same year and that was like another level of critics oh they hated they that fucking movie there, yeah <laughs> And it's and you know Sandler Sandler is interesting because Sandler sometimes it feels like he just wants to like get paid millions of dollars to go on vacation which I don't blame him oh. like I would I would fucking do that cuz cuz San- what what's so interesting about Adam Sandler is is that he's like the only Saturday night live actor who broke free like if you watch 30 Rock or you watch uh even like any Tina Fey movie or, or uh, you will see that Lorne Michaels, who runs Saturday Night Live, is still a producer on these movies. But Sandler broke free. Sandler does not have Saturday Night Live still attached to him in a way that, like, I mean, even, uh, you know, Mike Myers had that going on for a long time until Austin Powers. And, and you know, like, um, and you, you see, like, over and over again that Lorne Michaels is directly involved, even when these these actors and comedians are long past Saturday Night Live. But Sandler figured out a way to get out of that grip and just do his own thing. In a weird way, he's kind of an auteur because he doesn't give a fuck about input from yeah. anybody. He just does exactly what he wants to do. And, and that is something that I, I deeply admire, even though a, a lot of like these newer movies are not good. Although I don't know if you guys saw fucking Uncut Gems, but that was a yeah, mess. Yeah. Mm. I loved Uncut Gems. Mm. But yeah, um, with with X, it was sort of this incredible thing because it, it was such a wild social experience and the script was constantly changing and we it was it was exhausting because we were just dancing and and, and <sighs> Having our makeup done, uh, you know, we were constantly changing clothes because we were getting like there's the uh, in the one scene where I where I uh, explode my uh, beer all over <laughs> the, the the kitchen and all over myself. We like kept changing the suits every five minutes. <laughs> they had to wash all the beer out, and and, uh, and it was non alcoholic beer, so it tasted like shit. Oh, uh, no. I, no, I, the people who had the most fun were the extras. Man, they were just they they didn't give a shit. I saw like extras like getting like stoned i like there was like these two extras that got in trouble because they were like banging in a porta potty I mean, <laughs> and nuts and 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 uh, it was just it was so much fun and i met so many cool people but it was also it was also surreal because it's like you spend three months straight partying and then it's um i don't know if you guys ever watch futurama yeah Sometimes. a little bit yeah do you do you guys remember the episode with Slurms McKenzie where they go to like the Willy Wonka factory and they're drinking like the sludge soda? Yeah. <laughs> so the, there's this the part at the end where they find out that the, the, the sludge soda is coming out of the ass of this giant worm. <laughs> and, and, 
and basically the factory starts falling apart and uh, Fry and Leela and Bender, they're escaping and there's the guy, the mascot, Slurms McKenzie, and he's, he's always like the party animal who does all the marketing for the soda and he takes off his sunglasses and his eyes are bloodshot and he says, I'm so tired of partying, man. <laughs> That's how it felt for me afterwards. I'm like, fuck, I've done more partying in three months than I will ever do in my life again <laughs> and then it kind of like ruined parties for me for a while because i go to a party and i'm like well i'm not the center of attention anymore <laughs> this is just people hanging out there's no shit on fire like this is i and and, and it sort of distorted because there won't be a movie like this again we were trying to do no. a sequel for a few years and the reason why the sequel didn't happen is because everybody got scared of comedy about five years ago. Comedy mm -hmm. went under this very um, intense microscope where Hollywood became very sensitive towards offending anybody and in, in anything. And part of the reason is, is that um, we went from an industry that wanted to make $100 million on a movie to a billion dollars on a movie. Sort of this mm -hmm. Avengers effect, where after yeah. the Avengers hit, why the fuck would you make like a a, a mid-budget comedy when you want to make billions of dollars every time you release something? So the movies got so expensive, and they got internationally focused towards uh, non-English speaking countries, which is interesting because even before that, our comedies were pretty popular uh, internationally. But as it became such a um, movies became very visually oriented and television became more character oriented and, and story oriented. So when you have these movies that are kind of in the middle, like the movies that we're about to talk about, you just, there, there's not a ton of financial incentive to make them right now. And it's a goddamn shame because those are the movies I went into the, the business to really pursue. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so, you know, project X only cost $12 million. It was very, very low budget. Uh, for a Warner Brothers movie. Now, obviously, there's a lot of like cheap indie movies getting made that are that are way less expensive than that. But studios, you know, they they the average mid budget comedy would go from like twenty five to fifty million dollars, right? Mm -hmm. But now, most of the movies that get made, the the, the tent poles, they cost like one hundred fifty million, two hundred million dollars, and that's without the marketing. And we were also in this weird spot where we were at the beginning of. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram being used to market films. That was a new way of promoting stuff. Like we had, it was a really big deal when we took over YouTube for like two days in like 2012. That hadn't happened before. And now that that's the primary way of, uh, of uh, studios and television networks marketing their shit. I don't know if you ever go on YouTube and you, you see the, the recommended section yeah. and it's all, it's all like just ads and shit. That's because they're not actually like YouTubers being put there anymore. It, it's, it's how old media breaks into new media and it's been a, it's been a wild success for better or for worse. Now I, I love, or I loved the internet. The internet's scary right now, but, um, <laughs> You know, I grew up basically on like dig.com and like AOL Instant Messenger and MySpace and shit. So it, it, it was just this, we were in this very transformative period where the old internet was becoming the new internet and it became a lot more corporate controlled. And in a weird way, our movie was like a very early experiment in how that worked. And it was successful because the television marketing didn't really work. We had very few billboards. We didn't do a Super Bowl ad or anything like that. It was primarily internet marketing, and that hadn't been done before in, in a mainstream comedy, and it, it was a pretty big hit. I mean, we, we, did, we back when Vice didn't suck, um, and I actually wrote for them for a summer after the movie came out, which was a lot of fun. Vice, Vice today versus Vice eight years ago is like, I don't know, like, like – uh, like uh, like cake versus like a pile of shit. So <laughs> it, it's it was a real treat because it was very unfiltered. And so they did this thing called, um, and my friend Samir was involved in it. There was this marketing campaign where they, they interviewed all of these musicians and they did these animated stories of the craziest parties they, they had ever done. Like they had one with Snoop Dogg and they had one with Ken Jeong and they... They had uh, they had a bunch of them, and and it was just so cool seeing this sort of uh, you know this 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 kind of 
the amount of fun that could be had and the the ways that we could amp up the crazy, not just in making the movie, but promoting it. Like the press tour was a lot of fun, just going from city to city. And and basically the critics that we would meet with were always offended. They were always like, how could you condone the destruction of property? And it's like, we fucking don't, it's pretend. <laughs> but then the Project X party started popping up all over the world. And, and we like, not that here. Yeah, I didn't know how to fucking respond to that. It was like, it was always some rich kid had a big house. They'd invite like 400 kids over from their high school and then the cops would come and bust it up. And like, we got blamed for that. And it's like, it's not, I don't know. That's like blaming jackass when some idiot like, you know, goes on a shopping cart and like fucking uh, pushes it off a cliff with their friends on it. Like, that's not like the whole point of like these, sorry, go on. Every like nightclub over here claimed they were throwing a Project X party and it was essentially using red cups like in American Pie or something. And yeah. And the Project X soundtrack. <laughs> is, that not, is that not a thing you guys do, the red cups? Is that, no, is that, no, that's a very American? American. Solo, solo cups mm. is an American thing. American phenomena. You know, that's, that's always been a thing. I mean, uh, you know, I, and maybe it's because of beer pong. I don't know. <laughs> but um, we, we've always been big into red cups for as yeah, my whole life. We're just, you know, if there's booze and there's young people, there are red cups. Uh, <laughs> but with, um, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of work, even though it was also a lot of fun. I mean, I remember I like almost fell asleep in my car driving home, and I had to like <laughs> get a ride from like one of the, one of the 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 production coordinators just because it was like. 7 a.m. and I was driving back home from the Warner Brothers lot and I was just like I just literally passed out and had to pull over <laughs> like and then it, it was you know the it was it, you know I, I I actually I wrote like an early synopsis for the sequel because I, I love to write and I was I had an idea and it never got made but my idea was basically that like some fucking like rich Russian kid flies us out to like host a project x party but it turns out that like she's the kid of like an arms dealer that was connected to vladimir putin and so like all of a sudden like there's like you know rocket propelled grenades and shit and tanks and stuff but it just never it never happened and the studio went with like a pitch about um us being sent to a military school and like all the kids at the military school like waging a rebellion against like the so, sort of kind of like taps i don't know if you've ever seen taps an 80s movie with tom cruise like these these kids in an rotc uh military boarding school basically take all their military training and like wage war against like <laughs> like the the the, the general the ex-general running it it's a it's a great movie very 80s but but great movie and um I think it was Tom Cruise. Now I gotta look that up. I'm 99% sure Taps was Tom Cruise. But if I, but they should have gone with your sequel. <laughs> well, my idea was better, but they didn't. But they didn't. They didn't give a shit. I was like, I you can't when you get typecast as like um as like you know a, a certain type. Like n nobody. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't Tom. No, it was. It was Tom Cruise. It was Tom Cruise <laughs> and Timothy Hutton, and then George C. Scott was the general. God, what a fucking good movie. Uh, Sean Penn, too. The master. But um, you had sort of this thing where, and this is very common in Hollywood, you are expected to say a certain type, right? Like, And, and it's because people are brands. So if, if, I don't know if you remember when Jonah Hill lost all this weight, people would yeah, be like, he's yeah, not yeah. as funny anymore, <laughs> which is bullshit because 21 Jump Street was great. And and uh, you you just kind of see this thing happening where you like you are expected as an as an actor or performer to stay a certain type, and the reason being is that it's sort of like because we're brands. Like, say you buy a Kit Kat bar, and it's not you know it's not a wafer cracker that you can snap off anymore. Now it's you know a gummy bear. People go, what the fuck is that? So it's the same thing with with actors, where like you are not just playing the character you're playing; you are also playing the presentation of who you are. And so it's a weird phenomenon with marketing that I've, I've never enjoyed. And that's part of the reason why I really like making shit. As much as I love acting and I love doing comedy, it really is like putting together bigger stories that I enjoy doing. And, you know, I've sold a few scripts and blah, blah, blah. They never gotten made, but you know, <laughs> I have. And I directed a short film a few years ago, which, you know, was very much takes place in the 
old world. I've always had a very dark sense of humor, so I directed Horseshoe Theory, which is a romantic comedy about gay terrorists. And uh, <laughs> and I, I just like doing, I like making comedies about things that scare the shit out of me. And, and then I ran this this kind of this lefty podcast sort of for like, movie buffs and comic buffs and like sort of like who are also like Bernie Sanders people and that was a lot of fun but then that kind of like after a couple of years I got real burnt out on that I, I've, I've been doing political activism and shit like I went to my first uh, police brutality protest when I was like 17 most of my activism was focused on the Church of Scientology and how much they fucking suck but um I did that for years and years and years, and like uh, probably about last year or two years ago, I burnt out. I'm like, you know what? There's a whole other generation of protesters that'll take it from here. I'm fucking tired. I just want to, <laughs> just want to smoke weed and relax. <laughs> but but that's what happens when like you know my 20s were such an intense period with making the movies, with Project X, with Kid Cannabis, uh, with you know the occasional TV gig, with the podcast thing. So now I'm just kind of trying to chill and figure out how to be creative for when things sort of open up. Uh, Cause it, it'll be really interesting to see what movies are going to be like and, and, and what gets made. Now I, I have a hunch that there will be potentially more interesting and weird movies that come because the world has changed so dramatically. And, and I just don't see how creatives uh, are going to react. My big hope is is that mid budget comedies come back because goddamn, like I need to laugh, man. And I like <laughs> I I can't. I, I look. I mean, and, and comedy on TV is just so depressing right now that I just need like I need silliness and I need fun and I need like yes, maybe a little bit of social commentary, but 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 sneak it in, man. Like I feel like it's also on the nose. You're like, kind of getting bludgeoned with it, aren't you? Now everything's fucking, got like a moral every comedy rather than yes. just being funny well and that's the interesting thing so part of i actually think what the studio the studio was originally planning and i think this was genius but they didn't go through with it but they were they were promoting project x or the plan was to promote project x as a disaster movie sort of like twister or sort of like <laughs> so it's like you know this party going out of control like in the same way that like a, a movie about like a hurricane ravishing a town, <laughs> just like mobs of teenagers burning shit down. That I think would have been a genius way to market the movie, but instead it was marketing marketed as like, this is the party you want to go to, which like, yes, but also like it, it because the, the, the movie didn't have like an ending where there were consequences. We actually shot stuff where like the, the characters got arrested and they had to do community service and like all this stuff, but they didn't end up, the studio ended up cutting all of it. Uh, and I think that if you just added that one scene or whatever of us, like fucking like cleaning up the mess we made, that would have literally like had these critics back off by like hundred percent. But instead the movie ended with us all being like popular afterwards, which is very, <laughs> which is very funny and probably more realistic to be. Yeah. Honest. Yeah. Like, yeah, of course, whoever, everyone's going to like the, the kids who threw like the huge rager and, and, and kids don't <laughs> care about consequences that much. Like, you how know, was it teachers... sold to you? Was it like that? Or when that? you applied, when you applied for the film, like what was that the kind of film you thought you were signing up for? Like what? We didn't know shit. <laughs> we knew we were making a party movie. Project X was a tentative title. They didn't want to call it Project X. They wanted to call it something else. They just never came up with anything. <laughs> so, like, I think at one point they were considering calling it The Rager. It just never happened. <laughs> um, and, and, and so they just, the, the studio stuck with Project X. The studio bigwigs did not like the movie. Like, the executives, they were very uncomfortable making it. And they didn't really know how to market it, even though they did actually a great job marketing it online. Yeah. But they didn't know how to to translate it to TV ads or billboards. They just didn't know what to do. And then because we weren't famous actors and they had no one, they, they wanted to market it like we were real kids, which was stupid, um, instead of like promoting us as, as actors. Uh, they even had like, you know, there's the disclaimer at the beginning of the movie yeah. uh, about how it was documentary footage. I kind of wish that never happened because... Um, because it's not true, like, obviously. <laughs> and there are people, I still get messages, like emails or people. I, I, so 
so I made a new, I, I, I logged off of all social media for a couple of years. You found me on my new account. That's why there's like only a few hundred followers because I, I actually, I had a bazillion followers on, on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And I got, I got sick of being blasted with messages all the time. So I just, I just turned it off for a couple of years. And you found, you found me on my new account. Well, it's a lot of like, come party with me in Brazil type of messages. <laughs> like, and it's like, guys, I'm almost 31. Like, you know, like I'm, 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 you know, I've, I've, done a lot of partying <laughs> like, <laughs> like now i kind of want to just like uh like mellow out a little bit and and it's it's but that said like there was just nothing like it and, and um and there never will be anything like it again because i think the studio is way too scared of making a sequel just because of the outrage even though they made a lot of money i mean the movie made a lot of money we didn't but the the movie did uh and, and so it, it was uh, it was definitely a success for them. But now the focus is on why, why make a hundred million dollars when you can make a billion dollars or two billion dollars in the case of I don't know. Did Infinity War make like fucking three million dollars? I don't even know. <laughs> um, like just the money is so big and so global that sort of uh, comedies that that would play in like. You know, it's interesting. The The country that actually the movie was the most successful in, I believe, was Australia. I don't know why, but Australia, it had a massive cultural impact there. And um, I, I can tell you why. It, yeah, they, why? They they love a drink. That, that's yeah. <laughs> like, I, was there, I, was there, I was there for a year and that, that was all I did for, that was what I did for 10 months out of the year. Was just was party and drink. Skeptical. Uh, yeah, it makes complete sense that that's the place where that did the best. And is the uh, drinking age different there as well? Like it's eighteen here, and is it the same in Australia? Because it yeah, was big over here. That it was certificate eighteen here. Like I snuck in to see it just <laughs> before, like it came out like two weeks before my birthday, I think. Uh-huh. And it was massive because people were going there and then going for a night out. Or it was like you were going to a party before a party kind of thing. That's how it was sold. And 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 it and it was wild the theater <laughs> experiences. I we yeah. would we would I would go and I would go to them. I would just go to for the first couple of weeks. I would go and I'd walk up to the box office and I'd say, "Hey, I'm hi, hey I'm in this movie. Do you mind if I hang out in the back?" And the the audience reactions. It was almost like I don't know if you guys ever went to like the Rocky Horror Picture Show or something or the Room. You've never seen the room in theaters. That the, I said the disaster artist, but not the room. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, the room is unbelievable. Like I, I would go with my friends and see the room every every month because Tommy Wiseau would show up and he he he. We would we, it was on the third story of the Sunset Five in West Hollywood, and he would he would walk on the railing like of the of the escalator, like, like he would and he would like do like a tightrope walk, like he could have fallen to his fucking death and he just did it every single time and then he would do this bizarre q a where where where, um people would just raise their hands and ask questions and you would always go there and see like famous people there so it's kind of funny i remember i went to the see the room and i'd sit down and like you'd see like michael Sarah trying to get a seat or whatever (laughs) a few feet away from you and I remember this guy just looks at him once and goes, hey, Sarah, seat's taken. Like, people were dicks. <laughs> but, but, but people would get fucking wasted and they'd go see this movie. And that's kind of like the vibe with Project X, where, like, the yeah. audiences were drunk. They were, like, <laughs> hollering and shouting. And they were, like, throwing stuff. And it was fucking cool. Because you don't see that at movies very often where participation is part of the experience. And... um I mean, look, I mean, it's not, you know, it wasn't a perfect experience. Like, like some of the producers are fucking creepy. Like they, 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 God, I, I, we were encouraged to skip sexual harassment training. <laughs> like, <laughs> that kind of, they were like, yeah, go ahead. Like this one guy goes up to me. He's like, go oh, fuck the extras, man. Like, and I look back and I'm like, Ooh, like you couldn't, couldn't get away with that today. Um, and, and you know, I, I, but I, I, when I'm on set, I really like hanging out with crews. Because I'm I'm a, I'm a real dork. Like I spent a lot of time just hanging out with like people working behind the camera, the sound guys, the the guys who did color correction. Like a movie is not a movie without the, these hundreds of people doing doing incredible work, you know. And and I've always wondered like why are the people who star in movies 
I mean, obviously they're the most visible presence, right? But like actors, obviously they they bring the writing to life and they and they make it feel real. I mean, if they're if they're good. But the truth is, is that a movie really is like a product, a collaborative product of, of, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of people, right? You have the director, you have the producers, but then you have everything from the grips to the, to the sound guys, to the PAs, and they're all, they all do incredible work. And they, and I would argue they even work harder than we do because it's like, yeah, between like takes or whatever, like, okay, we're in like a makeup chair or we're getting our costumes put on or we're chilling out in a trailer, but like these people would work for hours and hours and hours and hours and and it's incredible uh and and none you know and and the money in this business is so much shittier than it used to be so it's like i really admire these people and and those are the people that really keep uh movies and tvs going the the people doing the 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 grimy work they call it below the line like, you know, like the, the people who get all the credit are called above the line, <laughs> which is, I, I don't know, Hollywood's full of shit like that. I mean, it really is like we, we, we have to do a better job in how we how we treat uh, people across the entire thing. Like, I hate seeing PAs getting yelled at and taken advantage of and extras mm-hmm. being talked down to. I hate that shit. But uh, and it is common and it is like part of the inequality uh, of the entertainment industry. But truly, like we couldn't have made it without all these incredible people. And. Uh, it really is just like, it was just a fucking one of a kind experience that, that I'll never be able to replicate, nor at this point, I don't, you know, you know, now that I'm 30 and it's been nine years since we shot it, um, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, it's too late, (laughs) like, we were we were going to make a sequel like 4 or 5 years ago but but you know the studio chickened out and um and that's that you know it's like now we're too old you know Oliver and Thomas and I are are way too old yeah. uh and and you know if they ever do make a sequel which I don't think they will but it would probably have to be with a different cast yeah uh, oh, 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 sorry oh, no, it was a no, I'm talking, wait I'm talking <laughs> over you guys it's your fucking <laughs> podcast I was, like, I was gonna say, I wondered if um, we could ask you on there's a lot of trivia on IMDb. I don't know how much of it is correct and, and what isn't. And I wonder if we could see what was Please, true. Yeah. And what's... Well, they, they say on there that there was filmed over 10 hours of party footage in total. I didn't know if there was anything in particular you were surprised didn't make it into the film. Like something you saw one day and thought it was a shoe in to be in the movie and then didn't Oh, make yeah. It. Um, I would so so part of what we did, and most of this footage did not end up in the movie. Before, before people were really using their um, their their uh, their iPhones and their um, and their and their and their smartphones to film video. That that was not huge in like 2010 and 2011 when we primarily like we shot a few months in 2010, then we shot a few months in 2011. And um, because they had to figure out because they they did a first cut and they wanted to do another cut. So they brought us in for a reshoot and um, they had these cameras. What were they called? I'm actually going to look this up right now. I believe they were called zooms. Just like, yeah, they were called zooms. Just like the fucking shitty quarantine software we all use now. <laughs> um, they were called Zoom cameras, and they were these little portable cameras, and they gave all the extras and actors Zoom cameras. So not only were they filming all of us, but we were also filming each other. And and most of that footage did not make it into the movie. So you had, like, dozens of hours of people just, like, filming wild shit, like whether it was jumping around the bounce house or whether it was, like, breaking windows in some of the, in in like, in in the, in the guest room. And and part of, or whether it was just like random people filming each other making out. So like a lot of it, there there was easily hours and hours of that kind of footage. And I I was actually really disappointed when the DVD and the Blu-ray came out that they didn't like pack it with all of these special features and deleted scenes because there really was like cool stuff that never made it and, and is probably just lost. So I have no idea where any of that footage went, but yes, there was, it it was mainly, it was, it was a lot of party footage. It was a lot of, you know, basically debauchery, you know, Uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> once so so Rick Shapiro, who I, I was pretty tight with him. We we've lost touch, but I like him quite a lot. Rick Shapiro, the guy who plays T Rick, the guy with the flamethrower. So <laughs> yeah. he he was never particularly successful. Actually, I think he has Parkinson's right now, which really sucks. But he was a guy who was sort of part of this underground stand-up comedy world in New York and L.A. He did, like, weird small shows. And he would rant and rave for up to three hours. He would talk for <laughs> three hours straight. And he would say the, he would say the funniest, most fucked-up shit. And, but he also was, like, you know, he, he had issues. So it was, like... <laughs> So I, when I first actually started doing stand-up comedy, I drove him around to shows, and I would hang out and watch him do shows. And 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 then he he married his manager, this this lady named Tracy. And and I don't know how he got cast in the movie, but it was really cool because I I was already kind of tight with him. But yeah, he, he he a lot of the stuff, and it didn't end up in the movie, but there was a scene where we're, where, uh, the three of the three of the, the, the kids are buying all the, the drugs from him. And then we steal <laughs> the gnome, which is then the yeah. catalyst for the, <laughs> the shootout at the end of the movie. Um, he would talk about the craziest stuff and he would just go on and on and on and on and on. And I mean, I'm sure you can find some of his stuff on YouTube. I mean, he would talk about, uh, like everything from like, you know, like a like like a civil war to like he would talk about getting in. You know about how how uh, how it's great to kill cops. Like he would just say <laughs> naughty stuff, and most of it didn't end up in the movie. And I wish it did because he is so fucking funny and one of a kind, and he's also nuts, but like in in a good way. And and he 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 just doesn't work a lot because his stand up comedy you can't put it on like you know. Colbert or Fallon or <laughs> whatever. Like, he's just too unfiltered. But those are the comedians I like. I love going to comedy clubs and watching, like, comedians who are, like, kind of crazy and don't play the game that gets them on, like, fucking N NBC or whatever. <laughs> like, they don't sanitize their humor. And, and I feel like we grew up in this time where, like, humor that wasn't filtered was cool. And over the last five years, there's been a real cultural shift where everyone's kind of scared to to make the jokes that they used to make. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at your list right now. Yeah. Another one, you got a lot of great comedies here, but like even a movie like Dodgeball, which was, you know, PG-13 when it came out, that would be a hard R today yeah. simply because simply because people would get very offended by that. It's crazy. It's a 16-year-old movie. God damn, what a classic. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm talking over we, you guys. So. We've, oh, said no, about no, so, no. we've said about so many movies on our list and, like, these couldn't get made today. I mean, we just did Tropic Thunder, which obviously definitely couldn't get made again. <laughs> but with countless other ones, we've said, like, these aren't even that sort of necessarily out there and you still couldn't do that today. Right, and part of the issue is is that it's not even that people would get offended by Tropic Thunder. They wouldn't. Like, the whole point of Robert Downey no. Jr.'s character it's in the blackface is to mock the idea yeah. of, of yeah. out-of-touch actors right yeah, yeah yeah but hollywood and the corporate look i mean like warner brothers is owned by at&t right now like the fucking phone companies <laughs> you know own the business like and then disney has such a cultural dominance and they're very controlling and and people who make things for disney have no freedom at all everything is in the hands of of, of the executives and so you're seeing not it's not even that these movies are couldn't get made today because they're offensive or people get offended. People always get offended. The the problem is is that corporations are so afraid of bad press, even though they've made yeah. more money than they've ever made, that they will listen to like some fucking Twitter freaks over the general public. And yeah. I don't understand that. Like, look, Twitter is the worst place in the world. It is a, <laughs> a, it is a diseased wasteland of awful people. And and for some reason, the the weirdos on Twitter have such power over what is acceptable and what's not. And I, 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 my hope is, is, is that we finally have this moment where we go, you know what? Who gives a fuck what these people are saying? Who gives a fuck if they're offended by this joke? Like they they are they don't spend money anyway. They're like they, <laughs> like they they're they, they're all pirating these movies. So who gives a shit? Like it, it, it's. 
And by the way, that was actually something interesting. Project X was the most pirated yeah. movie of 2012, <laughs> which I saw as a badge of honor. I thought that was cool. But the studios <laughs> freaked out by that. That, that, that <laughs> made them very unhappy. But more people pirated Project X than the Avengers. So <laughs> I always saw that as a badge of honor um, because it meant that we were, we were doing, it, it was kind of like in a weird way, kind of an underground project because it was just so out there and transgressive. And that's the comedy I like, comedy that pushes buttons and will occasionally make people feel uncomfortable. I'm proud of the movie, but when I, you know, I told Luke it was like a different point in my life just because, yeah. just because the aftermath was so weird. Um, it it really felt like the studio threw us all under the bus. They didn't really, they were just kind of like, they, they would pump shit into our heads. Like, you're going to be a movie star. They would just tell us over and over again. And it was like, you know what? No, like, I'm going to be the, the same guy I always was. I just will, like, occasionally get approached by a stranger. Like, it is what it is. Like, and, and, and but, but they, they kind of, like, inflated our egos. And then as soon as the movie was done, they kind of, like, cut us off like once it became clear the sequel wasn't happening the the studio totally lost interest in even like interacting with us and that that bummed me out but um it it, uh it it was just a -a one-of-a-kind experience some of the other ones we had on there were um that everything was shot in chronological order so by the end when you're supposed to be at the drunkest in the party and on drugs is because you've been doing all these exhaustive parts of the film at once is that how that's true or is that yeah (laughs) well well yeah i mean the the, for the most part we started filming chronologically with picking up all the supplies at the grocery store uh and and then and then the weird miles teller cameo he's an asshole i don't know why he was in the movie um (laughs) Oh, wow. but no, he sucks, <laughs> dude. That's He's you, pulled the, you pulled the curtain back there. Oh uh, yeah, no, sorry. Um, it's good. To, it's good to find out. <laughs> nah, he sucks, man. But but um, he uh, so that's that was like when we started at the grocery store, and then we went through the party. The only stuff we shot non chronologically was the high school stuff. We shot all the high school stuff at once at the end. So like the bef- the before the party. And the after the party, because it was all at Pacific Palisades High, and um, and and that was um, that that was a lot of fun because we we knew what we had already done, so yeah. it, it was just by basically putting together uh, all this crazy shit, it created the anticipation. But then after that, we immediately shot the aftermath, so it was just a real treat to do that, um, and uh, it, it it was. Uh, it was kind of wild to do all of that because the chronological nature of the movie, it gave us a, a momentum, right? So it, you know, it's not like we set a bunch of fire stuff on fire and then went back (laughs) to like, kind of like the scene where nobody is there yet. Like we, (laughs) by building it up chronologically, it really made every day feel like we were on this kind of journey together to just see how crazy can it get from here? Like, okay, last night was nuts. How's tomorrow going to be? And I think that that was a deliberate choice that Nima made. I, I, I can't, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I got the sense that that was on purpose. Did you do the jump off the roof or was that someone else? No, I, I had a stunt double. And the guy, it was great because he was older. Like the stunt double was a guy in his like 50s. So I always got a kick out of that where he had this, this this dude who was much older than me, and then he just put on like a fucking curly Jufro wig, and and, uh, <laughs> and you know, because that's what I got. I got especially now, man. I haven't gotten a haircut in fucking three it's months. Tough times, man. No, dude, yeah, oh times. no, I've got it's, my it's, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. Uh, I'm thinking about asking my mom to cut like because because um. <laughs> Look, I've always had, maybe it's because I, it's because I'm a member of the tribe, but I've always had the curly Jewish hair. And, and uh, it comes from all the Eastern European Jews from my background. And um, it, it, it's, but now I've got like a, like I am like a month away from a full blown fro. <laughs> and, and, and so I, it is, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like I got a bunch of pubes glued to my fucking head. And, and, uh, I mean, if you want an opinion, I think you could pull the throw off. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I feel like I don't have a choice. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, yeah go ahead. I was going to say, just from watching Entourage, which isn't a great point of research to go in with, whenever the movie comes out, they're all anxiously awaiting. It, was it like that for you on the day it came out, or was it kind of, did you oh, know yeah. it was going to do well? Like, did you know it was going to be massive? No, we, we had no idea if it was going to do well. We were very nervous it was going to bomb. because <laughs> because And we were nervous it was going to bomb because there was so little TV advertisement, and there was so little billboard advertisement. It, it was having a primarily online marketing campaign was a brand new concept. It had not been done where they're like, fuck TV. We're just going to do all this on, on YouTube and on Facebook. And that, and that was, that was intimidating because we had no idea if it was going to work, but it was so cool because we would just sneak into the back of the theater and we'd just see people going nuts. And that was so validating. It was mm. beyond, beyond cool. I mean, in terms of, um, like you talk about the marketing campaign, I suppose it's an added something to look back on with the film. But that rev- in a way, that film has then revol- revolutionised marketing. And if Agreed. you're ever going to pick, and this is n- no offence meant, because I do love the film, but if you're ever going to pick a film that was going to change the curve of the way films are advertised, I don't think you'd pick Project X. No. But be it a perfect storm, but it obviously it has changed mm-hmm. everything in the nine years since. Look, I mean, the movie did new things that studio movies hadn't done before, not just in marketing, but in terms of production. And we didn't really get credit for that. And that no, kind no. of, and that kind of, you know, whatever, you know, I know. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, and, and part of the reason is, is because the press we got was just so negative. And I still don't understand how people don't, didn't get it who were. Sometimes the, it the helps press. when you have that, but honestly. It did. Then no to write. But then they got scared. A, a few years ago, the studios all got scared of bad press. Mm. I mean, I remember when, when I don't remember, I wasn't old enough, but like there are so many movies throughout history where bad press actually really helped, right? Martin Scorsese made The Last Temptation of Christ in the 80s, and there were, there were Catholic and Christian groups protesting the movie. And, and <laughs> Scorsese and the studios ran with it, and they made a fuckload of money. But for some reason... In today's world of internet outrage, the 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 studios they go okay fine we'll listen to you and not everybody else who wants to see the fucking movie and that's a real shame. Um, did you really get the tri- the main trivia you get when you search Project X is that they sent you away to a theme park and that's why the chemistry is like this in the movie? Is that is well, that yeah, a true I mean- thing? Or- yeah, it's true. I mean, we did Thomas and Oliver and I, we were like best friends for a few years and then we just kind of all went in our own directions and, you know, lost touch. Yeah. But um but but yeah, we were very very close because none of us had had a movie or a gig this big. Oliver and I were not professional actors at the time. We were both doing stand-up comedy and sketch comedy. Thomas is a it was a trained actor. Um and, and none of us had ever been in a situation like the situation we were in. And, um, and, and so it was very, we went to theme parks. We spent like weekends, uh, in like cabins. We like went on vacations together. <laughs> we hung out at each other's homes all the time. I mean, we were very, very, very tight knit for at least three more years. And then when it became clearer and clearer that the sequel wasn't happening, it just kind of all fell apart. Like, yeah. and, and we all just kind of went in our own directions and we're not, none of us are really tight anymore. Um, and, and that's that's a little too bad, but also it's like the thing that kept us together was definitely the movie, yeah. and um, you know it is what it is. That's how life takes us. But you uh, about, yes, sorry. you said about things changing uh, when you lost weight. How was that? How the role was kind of pitched because you do get a lot of like a fat, fat jokes, jokes yeah. a lot of it. And I saw well, I don't know. there's a clip with Jonah Hill being interviewed after Superbad where. He's had the whole film being called fat, and then everyone in the press tour is making comments about his weight, and he just looks <laughs> so run down. Like, I can make jokes at me, but I'm not having it on screen, on camera. Well, I'll, tell you why. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you why it sucks. Because when you're in a controlled environment, you can have fun with it, and you know that we're all just kind of dicking around and, and being silly. But when there's like some fucking stranger sends you like a message where it's like, hey, fat fuck, it's like, hey, shut the fuck up, man. <laughs> and then here's and, and then and then I grew up idolizing my favorite comedians were all fat guys, right? Uh, John Belushi, 
Chris Farley. Uh, I, I worked as a production assistant before I made Project X on a stand-up comedy show where I got to hang out with Patrice O'Neill. I don't know if you guys know him. Yeah, uh, I know the name. Of, yeah. not seen that. Okay, go watch his... It's on YouTube. His special Elephant in the Room, one of the fucking funniest stand-up comedy specials of okay. all time. Uh, Patrice O'Neill, uh, John Panette, Ralphie May. Uh, I, love, I love Ralphie. Yeah, well, guess yeah, what? They're, peace, but... but you don't want to know why I lost weight? Because they're all fucking, they're all fucking dead, dead, dude. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what happens when you're a fat guy who parties all the time. You die. And, and <laughs> that, was, that was my brand. They, so, so my agents and the studios, they wanted me to stay that way because that's how I made money. And, 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 and it, I had this choice I had to make where it's like, okay, do I want to be the fat party animal for a living? And, and it's fuck- <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, which is fun, but then, you know, but, but then it just, you, you just, you just get to this point where it's like, I want to be healthy. And, 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 yeah. and, and so I lost 70 pounds and, and once that happened, the work cratered. And that's how, that's how fucked up Hollywood is. It's like, I, I, I it's actually kind of funny. Oliver and I, who played Costa, we switched. We totally yeah. switched. <laughs> go, go, go look up his Instagram. <laughs> we, we, like, he, he made all of the fat jokes. And, and, you know, a lot of those were improvised, which would kind of, you know, like they were just like, that's not even the script. You're just calling me fat right now, asshole. But like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that was, you know, part of the deal. Uh, now we live in a time where there's a, a health at every size movement where you have people online saying that if you're fat, it's actually healthy yeah. and look, it's it's not <laughs> so i i wasn't healthy i was fucking obese i was like you know 200 and fucking 40 pounds and i'm short so you know i'm five <laughs> i'm five five and a half i'm not even five six like i am i am a tiny man so i can't be as heavy because i'm because i'm short and, and so when i i made the call i had to like actually like calculate it like okay this is going to hurt my career but is it worth it and i said yeah because the alternative is is you know health issues, and mm. besides, like you know you can't you can't do fun drugs as much. So <laughs> <laughs> you said that you've been oh. sorry, go on. Oh, so I was just going to say where you said about uh, a lot of the fat jokes with basically his own sort of input, and you said well, before was, that yeah. they had sort of like a they had a script in place, but there was a lot of different things changing. How much of it was? Was it just like a skeleton script in place and then they kind of let you have fun with it or was it a lot more sort of in place? I would that? say, I, I would say, um, I, I would say, TK, uh, I would say that, that <laughs> we we are, um, it, it was 70-30 is what I would say. I would say 70% of it was on script, 30% was improvised. But the improvisation was mainly like dialogue and like dancing. So one of the really, one of the more funny and I look back and I cringe because it was it was actually not cool. It was like um, I, there was there was a scene uh, that and, and we made the decision where it's like, hey, Jonathan, why don't you go make out with this random extra in like and we'll just we'll just have like because there was these montages of us making out with all these girls. And so we I went up to, we 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 uh, the, the you know, they picked an extra and they said, OK, you know, are you cool with this? And she said, yeah. And so. I went out and it was really dark and I made out with the wrong fucking girl. I like went up to a different extra and started kissing her. And then the lights went on after when we cut and I went, oh shit, I'm so fucking sorry. I'm like a fucking predator. I feel like an awful person just going out to it somebody and just making out. And, and then her boyfriend got mad. Set too. And he approached me because uh, because there were these parties on the weekends that the background actors and the extras <clears throat> together and he approached me and he started screaming at me and i'm like dude it was an accident i didn't mean to make out with your girlfriend i know it wasn't cool it was really dark i went to kiss this other woman who we agreed to and i just it was so embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> You said that you've been doing some writing. I didn't know if there's kind of a fine line. Like if you've got a script and someone starts improvising, is there kind of a, a point at which the improvising should stop? Do you need to kind of earn your stripes Luke, for improvising? Or Luke, it's interesting because it's like, I think it depends entirely on the project. 
I think that improvisation is a great tool for um for essentially letting the actors have fun, getting them comfortable, and then occasionally you find gold in there. Um, mm -hmm. On the flip side, part of what, the reason I can't stand most of Judd Apatow's comedies is because they just let the actors go for like 10 minutes. Like, <laughs> The Four-Year-Old Virgin is my favorite one of his movies, but then like I couldn't stand Funny People, I couldn't stand um, This Is 40, and I couldn't stand uh, uh, Trainwreck. Well, Okay. No, Knocked Up was all right. I didn't like Knocked Up as much as everyone else too. did. <laughs> but like, there's like, there's like weird moments in Knocked Up. Like, why do they keep talking about Spider Man Three? Like, there's just. <laughs> but but and that's and, and that's part of the thing where it's like, even in the Forty Year Old Virgin, where like they do the you know how I know you're gay stuff with with Paul Rudd. <laughs> it is so fucking funny, but it also goes for like ten minutes and like. <laughs> so improvisation, I think, definitely has its place. Like, it's done really well in Bridesmaids. But uh, but at the same time, too much improvisation I think can drag a scene because in the end I think you have a uh, when you're when you're mm -hmm. writing a scene you're like all right the characters start in this place where do you where do you want them to be at the end of the scene yeah. and sometimes when it's meandering it it, it, it I, I I like tr I trail off just as a fan of comedies yeah so I, I and and I think also that comedies were were specifically in the 80s and 90s were very tightly scripted because there was so much slapstick, right? You like watch The Naked Gun with Leslie Nielsen, one of the greatest comedies of all time. There's no improv at all because because there's so much like, okay, here is the here is the joke and this is how the joke is done and there's a lot of physical humor and you can't really improvise when you're like, you know, blowing something up. So like in the scenes in Project X where we're setting shit on fire, very little improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want anything to burn down. <laughs> uh, and like when we had like a helicopter dump like a giant tank of water on us to yeah. like that, that was like, you know, you can't really goof around with that. Like this is when, <laughs> this is when the, the firefighter helicopter like pours like a thousand gallons of water in you. Man, we were fucking cold. Um, but it was just look, there was just nothing, nothing like it. So I would say that most of the improvisation came in dialogue and came in like specific like party actions, like dancing or making out or, 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 or uh, you know, motor boating, <laughs> <laughs> or, or just you know, uh, you know, running around pretending to be fucked up while everyone around us was actually fucked up, <laughs> and, and uh, that kind of stuff was easy to improvise, but there weren't really that many scenes where we would just completely change the goal of the scene. Yeah. Um, if we go on to the, the films that we have on our bracket and get oh, your yeah. opinion on which you prefer the two. So if you think the matchups are strange, they were kind of like, they were seeded in like revenue order. So we didn't kind of match them up any other way than that, which is what some of them seem a bit strange, but Bruce Almighty and Sex Drive was the first one that we did. Sex Drive. Sex Drive yeah, is super choice. underrated. Yes. Super underrated. It was. Yeah, Seth, we did it. Seth, <laughs> Green, <laughs> Seth Green is the Amish guy. One of the funniest <laughs> fucking characters. Yes. Thank uh, you very much. And then if you watch if you watch the, the director's cut, it's even yeah. sillier. Just yeah. random nudity yeah. and just like farts just that are just played. It's everywhere, just yeah. from the whole film. Unbelievably funny. The Rumspringer, the like, uh, uh, was it James Marston who plays like the dickhead brother? Yeah. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. God. It's, it's Clark Duke. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah. Bruce Almighty. I love Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey is one of the greatest physical. Uh, comedic actors of, of the last 50 years uh i mean and, and, and but but bruce almighty did not do it for me the same way that the mask or ace ventura did and it and i don't know why we watched it back it didn't didn't hold up for you no, no. not as well no. like, when we were watching it what we would have been like what was it 2003 or something like that so yeah, it was a lot funnier true. when we were a lot younger <laughs> yeah well yeah. i was i was born in 89 i don't know about what what we're year you got 394 oh wow okay God, it's weird. I, I'm so used to, and maybe this is because all all actors are vain. But like the idea of people being younger than us is like what? Like uh, <laughs> we have the same thing. Don't worry. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> how the fuck am I thirty? What the hell happened? Um, no, Sex Drive is the winner for me. With what you said about um, not knowing how it was going to do when it came out, I saw there was a tiny bit on 
Joe Rogan's podcast where they had the director of Sex Drive. And they said they did the first audience screen and they were told, like, this is going to be a blockbuster. <laughs> like, he was like, everyone has their film. This is going to be your film. And then it came out of cinemas and nobody saw it. Luke, I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> no, we I, loved it when we watched it. Some of these movies make a shitload of money um, on video afterwards. It's actually harder right now in a weird way. Um, the streaming services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and have made it harder to find those movies because the big money wouldn't just come in from the box offices. It would come in from DVDs yeah. and Blu-rays yeah, and yeah. VHSs. So before streaming, it was much easier to take a film that flopped and and, and give it a second life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. in a weird yeah. way, it's, it's harder because the algorithms created by the text gum ha have basically made it so that the same movies that have always been popular stay popular. And, and that's why, in the end, the most popular show on, on Netflix is still, like, The Office. Like, yeah. the compare, <laughs> like, we, we don't... Friends over here, so it's... Friends! <laughs> whenever that came out. Friends, Friends is, yeah, it's almost 30 years old. Can you believe yeah. that? I still yeah. watch Seinfeld all the time. I mean, I'm just as guilty. But but it, it, it's, it's wild to see. You'd think that with streaming, it would be easier to rediscover movies that didn't get a fair shake. And that's that's not happening right now. And I hope that that... I don't know. I don't know how we're gonna figure any of this shit out. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I'm not. I can't even. I can't even like uh, go outside without fucking panicking. So you know, <laughs> let alone figure out how to save comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the difference is now with streaming services is it there is less. It's less consumer choice, like you say with the algorithms. That yes. that streaming service has to pick this film for it to it's... have any chance. Whereas if you release something to DVD, like Sex Drive gets released to DVD. There's a lot more word of mouth and stuff, and people can pass it around, and it gets bought. You you give you give a direct consumer choice, whereas with the streaming services, if if you don't pick my film, then I'm fucked. It, right. It's just not it's not going to happen. Yeah, and Keenan, it's so weird because you 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 uh, like you basically part of it is video clerks, like the guys who would work at like the video store yeah. who would recommend. Like, there's the word yeah. of mouth effect, and like. That was like my church as a kid, like going to like a video shop and like hanging out with the guy working behind the counter and just talking about movies or video games for like two hours. Like I, <laughs> that to me was such, that was so formative for me. And, and you know, it's kind of interesting. One thing that gives me a little bit of hope is over the last few years, there's been a renaissance in record stores, even though yeah. like, so, so people do want physical media. And I don't know if you guys saw, but like, um, I don't know if this is happening in the United States, but but in the UK, Netflix panicked and the BBC panicked and they removed Little Britain, an episode yeah. of Faulty Towers, Mighty Boosh, yeah. all these really funny shows because they're afraid of offending people. And it's like, look, this shit came out years ago. Like culturally, we were in a different place. So like why erase comedic history for like that? That to me makes no sense. No. Um, and especially because the shit is still really, really funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I and I hope that 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 isn't a continuing trend, uh, because that is that would be really bad for preservation. But that's also why physical media is important, and and that's also why in a weird way piracy is important. Piracy obviously costs me money. You know, I didn't make any fucking money from all the people pirating Project X, but it did keep. But it does keep it around. People, yeah. you know, like you can't get rid of a movie if you can pirate it. You can't erase a movie or TV show from history if you can still find it on on a on a disc. Or on or on a pirate site. So like there is a case for piracy as a as a form of of uh, preservation, as like a form of literally preserving history in film and TV. And, yeah. and and then there's the case for physical media because nobody can take your DVD away. Like HBO yanked Gone with the Wind because it's racist. And like yeah, it's racist. It's also 81 years old. Like <laughs> find me find me someone. Find me someone who is young, uh, who is older than eighty-one, who isn't racist. Like fucking, <laughs> they're fucking old, and and, and like, let alone a, a movie. So like, but but if you had it on DVD or if you pirated it, nobody can take it away from you. And that's that's the curse of streaming. The idea that like your library is in the hands of someone somebody else. else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems a strange. It's, it's, I mean, especially strange times, but it's a strange conversation to have that we're talking about sort of physical medium being now being subversive and that you can keep this and that like, the things we're talking about little britain i mean little britain is is stupid it's it, like it is stupid as shit 
But that's why yeah. it's funny and that's why it works. And it seems odd that that's now because of the way, like you say, I mean, you said the last, you said a couple of times about the change in comedy in the last five years. Um, I, I'd say, I think that that reached its peak that big change, I think it was about 2017, 2018, and I thought, fingers crossed, we were sort of coming on to a downslope. Like some of the specials I've watched recently, some of the films, it looked like it was going to ease back and go back to an open comedy where you can make these jokes. And I then, hope so. I, 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 like, I mean, that's the, that is, without, is the dream. Obviously, we're in the same position as you. We all love comedy, um, and that's what we want. But it I think like it's going to change again. Well, I think, and that's and that's part of the. You know, it's interesting. It's it's. I don't know if you in the in the nineties and the late eighties there was a very similar moment. It wasn't as long as this one, but from like from like I don't know nineteen eighty eighty eight to like nineteen ninety three or whatever. The most subversive thing you could find was The Simpsons. That was considered <laughs> edgy, and, and everything else people were very offended. Um, and then, and then by, by, and then, but then people got sick of it. And then we went into like an extremely intense yes. other direction with like shows like South Park. And, and, and that was a, a reaction to sort of like the prudish nature of the early nineties mm -hmm. comedy. And then the late nineties and the two thousands, I mean, I mean, look, I mean, think about it, man. Like, so we had nine 11, the war on terror, the seven, seven bombings in, in London. I mean, you had all this shit going on. So comedy and, and horror too was brutal because that was how when, when you're in dark times, people tend to cope with like yeah. going in, in, in intense directions. I mean, the, the, the saw franchise and hostile, all the Eli Roth movies, like yeah. and, and it wasn't just comedy that was pushing back. It, it was horror. Like, I mean, and, and I would say that that is not, I, I do think that we are like culturally, we have this pendulum and I do think it will swing back when people yeah. get bored and that's all it is like it's just mm. consumer habits when people get bored of having like you know all the comedy they like being like look i mean i don't know if you i watched a couple episodes of fleabag and because because i was told like this is like the new british comedy you got to watch and i got bummed out i'm like this is sad it's like just about a sad lady and like and and, and it's not that it's bad it was incredibly well made but i just I, it's it's bummer comedy you should is, give Pete show a try I love Peep Show. Yeah, All right. it's my favorite. All right, and I, and I love um, fuck. What was the name of um, what was the name of it? The 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 show that was sort of the parody of sensational kind of like ridiculous American news. It was a British show that had um, it it had like this entire episode about like uh, about like a uh, pedophile panic. And like, I mean, obviously that couldn't get made right now, but like even Simon <laughs> Pegg and all these guys were in it. Um, I'm going to find that out right now. Yeah. You guys will know the show. Uh, Brass Eye. Yeah. Brass yeah, Eye yeah. was so fucking funny. And, and, and like, obviously you guys had Sasha Baron Cohen, which is why, uh, <laughs> the Ali G show was so formative for me. When I saw that, when I was like 14, it blew my mind. Yeah, which is so why, which is why you guys are wrong. Borat is <laughs> like, Borat is top top five funniest movies ever made. But we we got caught. We we got caught a little bit with. So like you say, formative for you. Project X would probably have been closer to formative for us. Oh, that's we true. Been, uh, we, you we guys are a few years younger. Than just you. as we yeah. turned eighteen, Project X. So like, I mean, some of this stuff in Borat, like I laughed when I saw it. I remember seeing it just after it came out on DVD. Like one of my mates, one of my mates had smuggled a copy of somewhere because we were like eleven, <laughs> and like <laughs> no, there's no way kids should be should be watching it. But we, yeah, right, like I, I, the first time I saw Bora, I didn't understand half of the shit in it. Whereas what well, the first time I saw Project X, I was like zoned in. I was like, this is it. Well, that this makes sense one. because I, I definitely think that that Bora had a lot of specifically like cultural commentary about american society yeah that that um even though you know he's he's a brit um it, it had such a like uh, uh you know it, it definitely skewed a little older so i can see how like as a high schooler project x would have blown minds because yeah <laughs> i was a few i was a few years older than the than the target audience but it was so cool seeing all of these like yeah. teenagers go wild at the screenings i remember there were also a lot of because the lorax came out the same weekend so there were a lot of like Teenagers who would buy tickets to the Lorax and then go walk into Project X because they're a couple years too young to get in. Um, but, uh, you know, 2007 and 2008, 
I mean, yeah, you had Trop 2006 to 2008. You had you had Borat, yeah, great, you had Tropic great. Thunder, and then and then you had um, oh man, Walk Hard, which is so fucking. That's my favorite Apatow movie. He didn't direct it, but he wrote it. But Walk yeah. Hard is amazing. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. Just because, and, and it killed the biopic forever. Because in the early two thousands, <laughs> yeah. we had Walk the Line, we had Ray, we had these very serious movies about rock stars and how tough their lives are and, and then you just had to walk hard that just took the piss out of it like they, he cuts his brother in half and he can't smell unbelievable <laughs> the songs were good too man yeah. um anyway I, I, that's not on your list so i'm i'm, I'm so what do you prefer out of um super bad and talladega nights oh that's a tough one because they're so different super yeah. bad i thought was is is you know, it's interesting. A lot of people compared X to Superbad. I don't think they had anything in common. I thought they were just wild. teenagers. <laughs> yeah, there's teenagers yeah. and there's like a party and like corny teenagers and that's that's it. Um, the whole genre but, but on that. We were, yeah, we were constantly getting compared to that, and I I just did not see, uh, I did not see anything in common. Talladega Nights has more laughs per moment than Superbad. Superbad is a really sweet film. Um, it also, you know, it, wow, I can't believe Talladega Nights came out in 2006. That's 14 yeah. fucking years ago. <laughs> wow. Um, it, it, you know, it's interesting. I didn't even know it came out before Superbad. That's wild. Um, Talladega Nights, I think, is the funnier movie. Superbad, I think, is the better movie, if that makes any yeah. sense. Yeah. So, like, I laughed more during Talladega Nights, but Superbad, in terms of, like, as a film, superior. We had... Um... American Pie and Role Models was the next one. The Sean Williams Scott Darby. Oh wow! <laughs> uh, role Models, another movie that that um, just kind of like for some reason people yeah. don't talk about that much anymore. American Pie was revolutionary in terms of like yeah. making a, a teen sex comedy that like because the eighties had all these like really intense. I mean, you had Fast Times at Ridgemont High, you yeah. had The Last American Virgin, you had Porky's. I mean, in the late seventies, you had Animal House, and, and and then and then the genre went away. Um, you know, you had and, and and you know you had like the sweeter John Hughes esque movies, like you know Ferris Bueller's Day Off and yeah. Pretty in Pink and Sixteen Candles, and then you had like the fucking titty fests, like Porky. <laughs> and, and, and so American Pie, what was so groundbreaking about that is it threaded the line. It had all of like the yeah. filth, with also a lot of sentimentality and sweetness great movie role models um in, in terms of like being like a a like i would say that american pie sort of like the same thing with super bad and talladega nights american pie is um i would say a a a more groundbreaking film but role models has like the laugh per minute ratio is off the fucking chain like uh every single character in that movie is funny Every single one, like there is no, it's not a movie that there's a little bit of sweetness, but I, I would say that that the priority was just on on making people laugh. Yeah. The kid Bobby J. Thompson who plays Ronnie yeah. is unbelievable. I I don't I don't really <clears throat> see him around in a lot of stuff. I mean, okay, he works. I just checked his IMDb. He's I think fine. he does uh, Nick Cannon's uh, Wild and Out. But I oh yeah, I, I, I'm, I feel like I read that when we were doing research for the. No, podcast. that's right. No, know. that's right. He is. Uh, he is on that show. But like, he, dude, he is so fucking funny, and and, and um, and just like the the, the the just the setup for the movie and the the larping, and, and 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 I think this is before like you had all these guys from the state like you know uh, like David Wayne and 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 and. Uh, the what's his name fucking um I don't know. oh yeah like uh you had like ken marino and 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 um and matt walsh and latruglio is in it like you just yeah. uh, and, and elizabeth banks and jane lynch and ken jong i mean you had just all these really funny like this was like i think them at peak funny and and um it just is like one of it is like one of these movies that should not have slipped under the radar because it really stands the test of time well when we did the reviews it got called the funniest film of the year and you had Step Brothers came out the same year for example Ooh. and there was all sorts of other like massive films came out the same year so 
It was definitely loved at the time, but then, as you said, it kind of slipped away. Yeah, and Step Brothers also is a great example of improv done right in a movie. Like, there yeah. was a ton of improvisation in that movie, but but it was it was tightly edited, and the editing makes a huge difference in improv. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever been to, like, a live improv comedy show, but 99% of them are shit. And, <laughs> and, the, and the reason why they suck so much is because there's nobody going, cut. Let's move yeah. on. It's just, it's just when you just have people like pretending to be toothbrushes for like two hours straight <laughs> or whatever the fuck they're doing, it, it just gets old. But role models, yeah, you're right. Role models probably fell under the radar because, um, because of uh, Step Brothers and also probably because Iron Man. Iron Man was the beginning yeah. of the end of, of sort of this era of, of movies. Uh, and we, Iron Man, obviously. Yep, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I was going to say, uh, we know kind of your pick for Borat Project X. So. Well, yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, on a personal level, on a personal level, I'm going to pick Project X because it made me money. But uh, so we did the work for you there. We picked Project X. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. It's a self-esteem booster, even if you're wrong. Um, (laughs) Had um, Liar Liar against That's My Boy was the next one. Liar Liar. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like That's My Boy. That's My Boy got shit on, too. Uh, (laughs) And it shouldn't have. Unfairly. Unfairly shit on. Oh, yeah. I mean, Sandberg is amazing. Sandler's great. I mean, having, having Susan Sarandon in there. I mean, oh, yeah. What a great cast. But Liar Liar, that was, this is golden age Jim Carrey we're talking about, like 1994 to like 1999, like this five year period. Yeah. I mean, God, you had Liar Liar, Ace Ventura, The Mask. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you had, and then he was great, you know, The Truman Show. Great um, film, yeah. Oh man, that, that wasn't even that funny, but he's still so funny in it. Like that's a you know a drama, but he's just as uh, ma- same with Man on the Moon. Ugh, Milos Forman, my man. Uh, you just had such you had this renaissance and liar liar, the scene where he just shits on everybody in the boardroom at his <laughs> <Yeah>. law firm <laughs> is so incredible. We've, so we've incredible. We said about reviews earlier. One of the reviews for That's My Boy said that. Uh, one in this film contains scenes of incest, masturbation, gerontophilia, statutory rape, and Adam Sandler. So you got <laughs> off lightly with some of the ones for Project X. <laughs> but that's but those are the good things in life. So why would they yeah. <laughs> the next one said it may be the worst film in any genre ever made? So they're oh, really just like the film. <laughs> come on. That's it goes back to what you that's... said about critics. <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, come on. Like, can you really say that's one of the worst films ever? Like, there are very bad, bad movies out there that don't even try. Like, you can say that like with with movies like The Room and with movies like Birdemic. Have you ever watched Birdemic? Like, that is a bad movie. Uh, Or or even just bad films. My favorite Batman is the one with George Clooney, which they... I see that. Them. That's in your background. You've got <laughs> yeah. the, the Schumacher poster. He's got the, he's got, Clooney's got the nipples that are taped on. <laughs> Joel Schumacher, by the way, Joel Schumacher is one of these directors who doesn't get like a fair shake because everything he makes is... Look, I mean, he's like an old flaming gay guy who just makes these crazy movies that are like very homoerotic like the lost <laughs> boys or um or even falling down uh but they're all incredible like these are these are these are like the guy just even his shitty movies like uh, speaking of Sh- jim carrey like the number 23 i can enjoy that like it, it, i don't get why schumacher hasn't made a lot of stuff in a while and i and i wish he would get back to it what, what did you think about uh, tropic thunder or pineapple express you know I'm actually going to give that one to Pineapple Express. And and when I watched Tropic Thunder, it was the fake trailers, Robert Downey Jr., <laughs> uh, Ben Stiller, were, I think, the best parts. It's the I closest did... week we've done so far in terms of picking a winner. Oh, that one's, it's a real tough choice. But I'm the, the reason, the reason I'm going to actually pick Pineapple Express is I thought Tropic Thunder and, and this is something that I've that that I've argued with friends about before. I thought it needed uh, an ending where they all die. I wanted them to all die, and, and instead <laughs> they, they make they make like a. I mean, even Steve Coogan when his head blows, like he, he yeah. like turn he gets blown up. That is so fucking funny. Oh, hilarious, yeah. And, and then and then uh, Stiller's character Tug Speedman, he's like playing, yeah. he's like playing with his fucking dead body because he thinks <laughs> it's the prop. Uh, 
Unbelievable. But in the, the, the movie ended with them like making the movie and yeah. getting awards. And I was like, no, it needs to end with like the villagers ripping them to shreds because <laughs> they're bad people. Yeah. And that would have been so much funnier. And Pineapple Express, I thought, had uh, had like a, a it's interesting because I, I the, the, this part of what made Pineapple Express so funny was the ridiculousness of the violence. Like in yeah. the, the the fight scene with Danny McBride is so fucking brutal. <laughs> yeah. Like they're just they're just fucking smashing <laughs> each other to bits and they're bleeding everywhere, but it's still so funny. Like and and, and I love that they figured out a way to make brutal violence and slapstick comedy meld. And like, yeah, the weed humor, um, y- you know, is pretty good. It's really weird how, how in the last five years, people don't really think that weed humor is as funny because it's basically legal in a, in a, in most States in America. I don't know. Nobody gets Maybe, arrested. Yeah. I mean, people, yeah, but do people get arrested for weed in the yeah. UK? Oh, they well, do. No, you don't and, have to have a lot. Yeah. Right. It's a different way. <laughs> People it's not America, a taboo, is it? Have like a no. in your house. <laughs> the taboo is gone. Yeah. And even though it even though people still go to jail with it in some shitty states in America, yeah. which is real it's real fucking unfair. Um, but because the cultural taboo is gone. Like I yeah. can smoke I you know, I can smoke a joint in the backyard at my parents' house and they won't care, right? Like that's that's where we are. Because the taboo is gone, a lot of the subversive weed humor. Like, I think psychedelics are next. Like, I want to see shroom comedies. I want to see <laughs> comedies about acid and ketamine. Those are the, that's the next frontier. Um, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the slight edge to Pineapple Express just because I like the ending better. Yeah. Well, that's one of the categories that we do the judging on. So ending is one of them because I, I remember reading that it's the hardest thing for a comedy is to nail the ending. And some of them, as you say, are really good and some of them are very bad. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and that I would argue was actually probably the worst part about Project X. Like, the ending is kind of weak. Like, there, there could have been something more as, like, a button, and we just didn't get that. And, and um, you know, it is what it is, but nobody watched that movie for the ending. They watched it no. for the two-hour crazy, yeah. or the hour of crazy, you know, debauchery. Um, well, it peaks I'm, at the scene does with Pursuit of Happiness, and then it's right. kind of... <laughs> God, that was, <laughs> God, that's another thing. The soundtrack of that movie is one of the best soundtracks of any comedy ever. We said yeah. it's the best ever that we can think of. Oh yeah. And Nima Nima is is a brilliant he was a I don't know if he still makes them, but he was a brilliant music video director. He did like a lot of hot chip videos. And, and um the guy just has like this style that that for some reason um hasn't gotten replicated. It really is one of a kind. And the cinematographer, this dude, Ken Sang, I think he did the cinematography on the Deadpool movies. That guy was a master, and he was cool as hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had Dumb and Dumber and Happy Gilmore. That's actually what we're doing this week. Ooh. Uh, Dumb and Dumber. I love Happy Gilmore, but Dumb and Dumber um, is, is, I think, another one of Jim... How did I not mention Dumb and Dumber when I was mentioning <laughs> earlier? That's an, that, I think... Well, the Fairley brothers, I think... Um, are, are they're not well one of them made green book they stop trying to be funny and they don't work together which is a drag uh the Fairley brothers you had dumb and dumber uh something about mary uh, me myself and irene uh you know stuck on you like they are they are masters of like silliness and but also like with this like this new england kind of vibe or I guess you know, because they came from Rhode Island, and the just the introduction with Dumb and Dumber with 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 Jeff Daniels and in the fucking dog van, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or 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 uh, Jim Carrey in the limo, just and then and then running out <laughs> running out onto the tarmac and landing flat on his face, or even where they they give they give the the blind kid the headless fucking bird. I mean, just the joke per minute ratio. Yeah. Is so good, but Happy Gilmore, Happy Gilmore is peak Adam Sandler. It's it's yeah. his best movie in terms of like his '90s run, just because what That's I what love we about picked it kind of you picked the, Happy Gilmore. We thought it was the Sandler one that had to be in there, kind of from everyone's perspective. That's kind of his film. I mean, I think his sweetest movie is The Wedding Singer. I think that That's, like yeah, but um, but Happy Gilmore. What I love about Happy Gilmore 
is it's a movie where the good guy uh, has insane rage outs. And I love that. I love the idea that like the 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 hero is a dude who just has violent temper tantrums and like <laughs> He like kicks the shit out of people. He breaks stuff. He like he screams at people. And like that's Adam Sandler. The the message is of, of these movies is like you don't have to be like a perfect person. Like you have to have like, you know, if you have a good soul, it doesn't matter if you're like a fucking crazy fuck up. Like, and I love that. <laughs> because I feel like we live in this world where like we are now judged for our worst moments. And it's very easy with social media and with with the way that we look at the world that like someone does something bad and they're like bad forever. And like Happy Gilmore and is like a movie about like essentially like a very good but violent man. And I love that. <laughs> with Dumb and Dumber, you have I mean, you have the mobsters, you have uh, the, the bizarre like like one way romance the ending where they refuse to get on the bus with the models. <laughs> I, you know, this is. I'm this looking is, forward to rewatching it this week. I don't know <laughs> if I, I can't I don't wait. Know if I, can, I don't know if I can pick between these two, to be honest. I'm at a loss. <laughs> well, what we have, we had um, four-year-old Virgin and Anchorman. Anchorman, 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 and uh, Anchorman is. Because it's it's a pure joke movie. It's Will Ferrell at his best, along with Step Brothers, um, and, and and every character is funny. Um, every character, uh, you know, the news team, the villains, the cameos, Jack Black <laughs> kicking a dog off of a bridge. Uh, <laughs> The, the the extremely violent newscasters fight where Steve Carell kills a man with a trident. trident. <laughs> uh, uh, just like you just have all like Vince Vaughn is this weird like mobster guy. Uh, was it was it Christina Applegate? Was it Christina Applegate? I you believe. Have, yeah. 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 She yeah. is so fucking funny in that movie. Uh, the whole way through school, it would be someone would meant just drop one quote into conversation, and then there would be the same 15, 20 minute conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you're still talking about the film. <laughs> oh, and that, and that, and that's, and that's, the, Anchorman was definitely. It's interesting. Those both of both forty year old virgin and Anchorman are like very quotable. Like, yeah. there's always, and especially, let's see, what year did Anchorman come out? Like two thousand four. Oh man, I was 15. So yeah, like everybody, everybody in high school was just constantly, you know, saying, saying, uh, you know, you know, uh, I love scotch or, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it's, um, oh man, it, uh, it just, it, it's, uh, you know, San Diego, the whale's vagina. Also, I don't know if you've, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been to California but um, the, yeah, the, the 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 smelly pirate hooker, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like the all the stuff about San Diego and like the weird kind of culture there was was pretty pretty dead on. <laughs> Anchorman two though, oh man, that was bad. I don't know how they yeah. fucked that one up. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you had from like the the early the early two thousands was like. The 2000s and the early 2010s were were pretty great um, in in terms of uh, in terms of in terms of that kind of shit. Yeah. We had um, Ted and Harold and Kumar was the next one. Harold and Kumar. Uh, oh, Harold and too. Kumar is super 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 funny, um, and it's and it's a great drug movie. Ted is pretty funny, but I didn't like it as much as everybody else did. Um, I'm, I like I don't love Seth MacFarlane that much, and I thought that Cal Penn and John Cho are they don't do a lot of comedy, and, and they should. And the Harold and Kumar trilogy, um, I mean, look, they're they're great. It's it, it, in just I love. First of all, I love road trip movies. I love movies where people start somewhere, then and they then they just travel. And the idea that like they're not even traveling that far, they're just trying <laughs> to get to a, like a hamburger shop <laughs> is, is so great. And it's another one of these movies that because weed is now legal or not legal everywhere, but but is culturally not not um, stigmatized, like 
the the scene at the beginning of the movie where they get stoned and they watch like the the guy in the commercial smoke weed and then put <laughs> yeah. a shotgun in his mouth. Like those commercials when I was a kid were totally real. Like I remember when I was a kid, you turn on MTV and there'd be a commercial where and I think it was with Rachel Lee Cook, uh, like like from from uh, she's all that and shit. Like she would like she would like take an egg, and she would like they, she would like start smashing it with the frying pan, then trashing a room and screaming about how drugs would make you lose all of your friends and destroy <laughs> your life. There were so many weird like I, I remember as a kid there was this thing called Dare, uh, where they'd have like a cop come to your classroom and tell you about the evils of drugs. And they spent a lot of time talking about how like weed would like, first of all, they, they said it was a gateway drug. So like you'd start yeah, smoking so weed, the... then, then you'd end up shooting <laughs> fucking heroin into your Heroine, arm. A week later. <laughs> yeah, like, oh man, I love this. Why don't I take some fucking, some drugs that will kill me? Like, <laughs> might as well, cause I'm, cause I, cause I'm, I'm so stoned and it's terrible. I'm 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 having sex and eating pizza. It's the worst. <laughs> Dangerous. Uh, I'm gonna give the edge to Harold and Kumar. Yeah. Um, Twenty One Jump Street and Step Brothers. Ooh. You know what's interesting? I liked Twenty Two Jump Street better than Twenty One Jump Street. And I think the reason I liked Twenty Two Jump Street was because it just it was a sequel about how sequels are bad. It was like a meta movie. <laughs> And 21 Jump Street is very meta, too. Uh, my buddy Dax was in it. I love Dax. Uh, Dax Flame. So I'm always happy. I was happy to see him getting a lot of work um, for, for that brief period of time. He's not doing as much right now, and I wish he did. But, hey, you know, we're, we're, I'm, in, I'm in that boat, too. Yeah. Step Brothers, though, is um, what I love about Step Brothers and why I'm going to give it the edge is because it's, it's Adam McKay's funniest movie it's funnier than anchorman and it's funnier than talladega nights and adam mckay makes a lot of very serious things now like he doesn't want to be funny anymore and like i get it like sometimes you want people to like respect you and take you you know with your work and you want to say something but with Step Brothers, okay everyone from um uh, everyone from from uh from will ferrell to to adam scott to 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 the, the best part of Step Brothers is, I, I think, John C. Riley. But then you have Katherine Hahn, uh, and you have Mary Steenburgen, and, and, and Richard Jenkins, and, 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 and Andrea Savage. I mean, just it is, it is, the cast is just unbelievable. Yeah. And, and it's an example of improv in a movie being done right because it's still tightly edited, but you can tell that good chunk of the movie is Will Ferrell and John C. Riley, who are two of the funniest actors alive, just just like going, acting like eight-year-olds. And it's just, <laughs> it's just seeing a bunch of dudes in their 40s acting like they're eight is is like boats and hoes and, and the, the job interview and the fucking, uh, when, when, when at the ending where, where the Brennan, is, he's singing Andrea Bocelli uh, I, 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 at the Catalina wine mixer. I mean, it is, it is, um, it is a movie that is just constant laughs. So yeah. anytime, like if there's like, if there's like, it's one of these movies where you're laughing so hard, you can't really even like breathe. And, and, and it's one of these movies where the plot doesn't matter and and it's okay sometimes the plot sucks and it takes you out of it but with Step Brothers, it's such a simple movie like you know um you know two like extremely immature men are forced to like live together and maybe try to grow up a little bit like it's <laughs> it's just it's so simple and and that's the beauty of the film there's no there's nothing as convoluted there's no crazy subplots it just is what it is um, we had Wedding Crashers and Dirty Grandpa was the next one. Wedding Crashers. Yeah. Wedding. I didn't like Dirty Grandpa. Uh, I, I you know, we're massive on Wedding Crashers. Yeah. Wedding Crashers. That's another movie where like Will Ferrell just shows up for five minutes and steals the show. <laughs> steals the show. Yeah. Yeah. But like Vince Vaughn, very. Um, he's another one of these actors like John C. Riley who is very, 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 very good at comedy, but like probably prefers doing well i don't know actually i think john c Riley might prefer comedy but vince vaughn likes being serious 
And but but Vin, Vince Vaughn is so fucking funny in this movie, just as like and, and then uh, Isla Fisher is is great as like the psychotic like um, <laughs> new girlfriend. Uh, and then Owen Wilson, he was I don't know, he just kind of like he doesn't really make as much stuff anymore, which is too bad. But he just his whole like kind of surfer guy laid back. It was such a fun. It was such a fun shtick. And uh, just the, the concept of, like, a couple of, like, sleezes showing up to weddings to get laid. I mean, it was... So like, good. Chris was walking of, in there. At the end of when we've spoken about each film, we say, uh, would this movie improve with Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn in there? And we try and cast them in the film. And Most in of Project it. X, in Project yeah. X, we had um, Vince Vaughn as the neighbour. And Owen Wilson is the old guy at the party playing beer pong. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Those two actors, Rob and Pete, are really nice guys. I haven't spoken to either of them in forever, but being on, they were really cool guys. Pete, I think, he was on like Crazy Ex Girlfriend for a while, which I didn't watch, but I was, I was glad to. And I don't know what Rob's up to. I should reach out. I should reach out to these fucking people. Hey, how you been? <laughs> Long time no talk. Um, but uh, it's it's part of the appeal of X was that they actively avoided casting stars. Like that was intentional. Yeah. We were trying to do a Kanye West cameo, but he wanted so much fucking money that that never happened. But that would have <laughs> that would have been, been incredible. Something else. Yeah, he wanted like he wanted hundreds of thousands of dollars to show up for like two hours. I think it so, might be cooler the idea that he maybe showed up. Like they yeah. Say at the end, like Kanye West might have showed up. I think that, <laughs> that was that was that was kind of like a weird dig because he did, you know. But but the goal was to have him there. Uh, there was an entire scene with I don't know if uh, this he was really big at the time. Simon Rex, he was this MTV VJ, and he had this persona called Dirt Nasty. Yeah, it's, it's like, in the yeah. extended cut, isn't it? Oh, it is in the extended yeah. cut. Cool, cool. That was a really fun scene to shoot because it was just that was just him. Because we just basically drag him out of there after a while. That was really fun. But originally, <laughs> the idea was for like Kanye West to like helicopter in, like which was just such a such a great idea. But it was it was just too expensive to do in the end. Yeah. Um, no, I'm gonna give the edge to Wedding Crashers. Um, Bridesmaids and Game Night was the next. Bridesmaids, one. but that's also because I didn't see Game Night. It's so, really good. It's worth yeah. watching. Yeah. The director made out with my questions. date. The director, the director invited me over to a party, and I like, and, and we we hung out a few times, and I brought a date over, and he hooked up with my date. So after that, I stopped. Well, I was maybe, like, Fuck maybe you, don't man. watch it. Then. Well, I don't <laughs> know. I don't give a. Shit. That was like ten years ago. What do I give a shit? Like that was uh, that was revenge for you and that extra in Project X. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, I guess so. It's the universe karma, got back at you. Karma coming back to bite are... me in the ass. Two after 2012, I think, which was. Um... Game night, and there's one more, I think, but I've probably forgotten what it is now. But no, they were the, one of the only two that we had that were that kind of recent. recent. Game night was really good. Yeah, because yeah, you're right. The the kind of comedy just doesn't. It's just not in vogue, and and, and I think it will be. I think especially when the pandemic ends, people are going to just be so desperate for some fucking levity. Yeah. There's no levity right now. We live in like no. shit world. So I think people need something like that. I really do. I think like we're, I think it might take a few years for uh, the industry to realize that need, but it's there. Mm. Um, we had uh, The Hangover and Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead. And, and that's, and, 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 and I, and that's, that's a tight, that's a tight edge because The Hangover, Hangover is a movie that, um, when it came out, blew my mind, but I think Shaun of the Dead holds up much, much, much better because, first of all, it's it it what it manages to do, and, and, and first of all, Edgar Wright is an incredible filmmaker. Like besides even comedy, the guy just is he's he has this brilliant sense of timing and editing. Uh, uh, Baby Driver, which is not yeah. my favorite one of his movies, but is like almost like a perfect like hour and a half long music video. Yeah. Like the guy understands timing. In a way, and 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 Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are so fucking perfect in the movie. The casting is perfect. Simon now there Pegg's are moments from the same village that I'm from. No shit. <laughs> yeah. it's, does he does he ever pop by? And I've never seen him. So uh, <laughs> he's he's left it behind. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Uh, my favorite of the Edgar Wright movies is Hot Fuzz. 
Hot Fuzz is, I think, my, like, I prefer to Shaun of the Dead. But Shaun of the Dead, what's amazing about it is not only is it a great, like, parody and satire of zombie movies, but it's a great zombie movie on its own. <laughs> and there's very, there's very few movies that can do that, like, take the piss out of something while also embodying it. And, and that's and that's just that was just like when it came out that like it, it has like more of a mind blowing effect than The Hangover had. Now The Hangover has these perfect comedic moments with Ken Jeong and Mike Tyson and the fucking baby and Galifianakis, <laughs> who, who I would love to see. Zach Galifianakis is like I, I don't think he wants to be silly anymore. Like I think no. a lot of he, he kind of does a lot of like I watched Baskets and I liked it, but it's sad. Like, I mean, that's that's another part of the sad comedy trend that's really big right now. Um, and, and, and I think that The Hangover just doesn't have that test of time element that Shaun of the Dead has, but it's still really great. Yeah. So when we were yeah, picking our when we were picking our list of films, we we had a direct choice between Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead. And, and you picked Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was close, but I think. Just because it's the first, it, 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 I, I think just as a as a consensus, we went with Shaun of the Dead. Uh huh. Um, but it, they are two very good films. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, Dodgeball and White Chicks was the next one. Dodgeball. I watch that movie every fucking month. I watch <laughs> it constantly. It is, it is a movie that I still watch all the time, and um, I, I, uh, I, I mean. First of all, that's a, that's another example of a of a comedy movie that has like very 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 little improv in it, but is tightly tightly scripted for the physical gags. Rip Torn, rest in peace. It's so fucking incredible. I mean, he's also yeah. I mean, he had this like renaissance. Rip Torn was a very very serious actor for most of his life. He only started doing comedies when he got old. Rip Torn in the 70s was like on an art house film with Norman Mailer. They got into a fight and he bit off Norman Mailer's fucking ear who attacked him with a hammer. Like he was an intense guy. He was an alcoholic. He just died like a year or two ago. He was like in his yeah, 80s. Yeah. Rip, Rip Torn, five or six years ago, maybe a few years longer than that, he broke into a bank. He passed out. The cops found him with a gun and he complained that the hotel sucked. <laughs> like, he thought he was so fucking drunk, and he was in his 80s, and he thought, like, this is a guy who, like, just was, he spent his entire life totally wasted, and you can tell, but he's also, <laughs> he's just such a dynamic and funny guy, like, you know, same with in Men in Black, he is so fucking good in Men in Black, yeah. like, he, he just steals the movie, and then you have Jason Bateman and Gary Cole yeah. doing the color commentary throughout, yeah. like, and, and then ESPN 8, the O show, I mean, or, 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 or sorry, Gary. I, I, I mean, just the, the the even like. Ju I think your mic's been mm -hmm. muted. Yeah, yeah, it looks like it. Your mic's gone uh, mute. Yeah. There. <laughs> Some boy, by the way. I don't know if he can still hear me, but he's right on. Yeah, he can. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I accidentally clicked. I yeah, accidentally clicked. No, it's my fault. I accidentally clicked the mute button. God damn it! Sorry about that. You have, <laughs> right. have to edit that out. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, with dodgeball, you have an incredible cast, a great heroes. Christine Taylor, who I think. Uh, I think it was Ben Stiller's wife. Maybe still. I'm not sure. She is so fucking funny in that movie. Uh, every character is funny. Yeah. From Alan Tudyk, Steve the Pirate, to, to Michelle. I don't know the actor <laughs> who played him, but like the guy who plays Ben Stiller's bodyguard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben's bodyguard. To, to the random Lance Armstrong cameo, which actually <laughs> is even funnier now that he's yeah. disgraced. <laughs> like, because he's a... He's taking steroids the whole time. So when he gives like the pep talk to, yeah. to Vince Vaughn, it's even funnier now that yeah. we know he's fraud, which is so <laughs> incredible. Um, everything about that movie holds up and and um and I will watch it. I will watch it 
constantly. I was up for this movie that the director made called We're the Millers, and I got really depressed when I wasn't. I didn't end up getting picked. I was like in the you know top three choices or whatever. But then it came out and it stunk, so I felt a little better. <laughs> um, but but Dodgeball is a movie that um, you know that, and then the other like there was this trend in the early two thousands of like sports comedies, and then that went away. I, another one that, that that is like much more underrated that I really love was Blades of Glory. I don't yeah. know if you guys remember that Will one. Ferrell, yeah. Yeah. Will Ferrell and then John Heater, and then you had <laughs> you had Amy Poehler and Will Arnett as like incest siblings. <laughs> like and, and you had you just and you had um, Jenna Fisher who is so funny and she's not. I don't see her doing like a lot of. Com- I mean, I guess nobody's doing that much comedy right now, but like. <laughs> It just oh yeah, these are these is like we. I feel like I grew up during like this second golden age of comedy, and I want it back. I'm like, it was like this 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 fifteen this this like twenty year period of just great comedy, um, maybe a little longer. I mean, but but then like I just it's just the the the, the sensibility of modern humor. I, I I think the shift is inevitable because like look, the world is sad like. Give give me something fucking to laugh about, like, um, but yeah, dodgeball, 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 dodgeball. I like white chicks just fine, but yeah. oh yeah, dodgeball. Just the sheer frequency of how often I watch that movie, and, and and just and also there's like jokes hidden in there. Like you realize like that 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 um, like like these little things that you just miss. Like the fact that uh, the good guys are called the Joes and the bad guys are called Cobra. Like there's just like they hide like just these goofy ass like references in there. <laughs> like you, you have um, oh man, just even like oh god, like I I, I can't even describe how much I love that movie. <laughs> I can't put it into words. It had um, scary movie one and the first Austin Powers International Man of Mystery. Oh, I love Scary Movie, but I'm going to get the edge to Austin Powers. Austin Powers is kind of like what I love about movies that take place in the past is is that never or that are about the past is that then time passes and then you see um that you're seeing like the 90s version of the 60s cuz now the 90s are over, but there's a, and, and so we probably look at the 60s and the 90s differently. Yeah. And I and I get a kick out of that. So it's like a double time capsule. Elizabeth Hurley, who was like one of the world's biggest supermodels at the time, hanging out with like Mike Myers, who looked like <laughs> the crazy fucking buck teeth. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and just like the just like the fact that he's like back in the 60s being a pervert was kind of cool. <laughs> and, and, and just but but like also him also playing Dr. Evil. Like that was there was kind of that trend where you had like Eddie Murphy. And like in the Nutty Professor, like playing himself, but also playing his family. And Mike Myers did that really well, also. Um, you know, maybe part of the reason he's not making those kind of movies is he's got all the Shrek money now. But <laughs> I love, like, I love James Bond movies. I love spy movies. I love True Lies. So like having having a, a movie that sort of takes the piss out of the spy genre while also showing reverence to it. It's kind of the same thing with Shaun of the Dead. Makes fun of zombie movies, but also like clearly loves them. I love that. And um, I like the second one, too. People don't like Austin Powers' A Spy Who Shagged Me as much, but I love that. I, I thought it was just it was just a great trilogy all around. The, the final one we had was uh, Knocked Up Against Old School. Old School. Um, old School... Well, I love party movies, so maybe that's that's part of it. Um, <laughs> But having um, an old school, I give a lot of credit uh, to 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 actually to to you know if if Luke Wilson wasn't in that movie, it would have been like a really kind of like it would have been funny, but also like very like grimy, and so like having him as like the the like he's this perfect counterbalance to all of like the crazy shit happening. Also, I don't know what his name is. But this guy who played Blue, the the older, the old man, he was like in all of these movies in, in the in the late '90s and early 2000s, and that guy was fucking funny. I'll, I'll look him up um, because he he also he stole the show. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let me let me go fucking look this guy up just because I want I want to know. Um, now you know I uh, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? 
Um, his name was Patrick Crenshaw, and this is a guy, he's just a supporting character in all these movies. He died in 2005. He was 86. I mean, yeah, this guy was in, this guy was around forever. I mean, he, and, and just having him, um, having him just steal the show in this movie, having like an 86 year old man kind of take over this, this, this movie when he hadn't really, uh, oh, he was on Mork and Mindy. Wow. I mean, this guy had been, a, he, he was never like super famous or anything, but I love character actors. I love actors that people call like that guy, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah, there's that guy. Yeah, yeah. And so the, he, he was, he was, whenever you see an actor like that, I always get excited. So he, he totally actually, I think stole the movie. In fact, I thought the movie was less funny when his character died. Like after he <laughs> died, I didn't enjoy it as much, but I still, I would definitely, definitely give the edge to old school. Knocked up like all the Apatow movies. I think they're too long. Um, there's Knocked too much. Is long. It's, two oh, hours, it's, like, it's more than two hours. I mean, yeah. the, the new movie he made, and I haven't watched it yet. The um, the the King of Staten Island with with no. Pete um, Pete Davidson. Um, Pete Davidson, yeah. dude. That movie. I'm not. It's two and a half hours long, man. Like Oof. that's like like yeah, the fucking Avengers or something. It's so <laughs> long. Like I watched The Irishman, which is three three and a half hours long, yeah. and like I was on an airplane, and like that's how I <laughs> like. Otherwise, like I don't think I could sit there. Like I, I've got a copy of Once Upon a Time in America, which is like a classic, but it's you four got hours. Director's cut. I do, and I haven't yeah. watched it yet because it's four fucking hours. Yeah, and I'm like, good. I have to. You have to commit. Um, it is worth. But also, watching. but also, what's that? It is worth watching. That director, Sergio Leone's director's cut, is worth watching if you get. Yeah. If you can block out four hours, it's worth I, watching. I, I should because I love I love all the spaghetti western movies. Yeah. I love uh, you know I love the Clint Eastwood movies. I love the, the 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 man with no name movies. Yeah, and I love crime movies. Yeah. And and so you just yeah. we're, we're, I'm trailing off a little bit. I, I did great. That's right. It's my fault. So, it was just. The, do, you have a, do you have a? in conversation. So, say again. Do you, so, do you, do you have, have a favorite in conversation? So you don't get to pass. You don't pass up on that. When okay. You get yeah. that. Do, do I have a favorite fa of all of the ones that we spoke about? Oh man. Okay. I I can't give you a one favorite because there's just too much good stuff. But I'll give you my top five. <laughs> okay. So and and this is in no particular order. Yeah. So um. On my top five, I'll put Borat, I'll put Dodgeball, I'll put, let's see, Borat, Dodgeball, Step Brothers, um, and then the last two I'll give to Austin Powers and Dumb and Dumber. Good list. Okay. And that, those well, are going to be my five on the list. That's, uh, yeah, I mean... Thank you for giving us so much of your time. Today. Yeah, thanks a lot. Two hours, oh so yeah, well look, so what much. the what the fuck is the else there? Dude? There's nothing. <laughs> I mean, Ca California said that they're gonna start um, letting people film again, and I'm like, fuck that, man. I'm not. I'm not gonna fucking get the fucking coronavirus. Like, I I, I will wait. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, this is this is there's there's nothing. Look, I mean, are you kidding me? Are you, you you know, Luke Luke hits me up and says like, do you want to talk about like movies? Yes, I do. Like that's <laughs> what I like to do. So this is a real pleasure for me. So thank you, TK. Thank you, Keenan. Thank you, Luke. No, uh, any anything else you want to ask before you? Just, you uh, there is there is a question, John, if you don't mind, <laughs> but you can say say no, and if it like we can edit, <laughs> edit around it and stuff. But it's something that in fact we found out, and I just want to know true or false. We've we've been we've been informed about you starting films prior to Project X. Oh, you mean the porno? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I made a porno when I was eighteen. Who gives a fuck? Uh, no. people, people, mate, have been honestly, dicks. A, mate, people honestly, have been... amazing. It's it's class, but we did, we've been we've been talking about it. We didn't know if like, we didn't want to broach the subject and. Have you no, I mean I don't. I'm over it, well. man. I used to get like real annoyed. I used to when I was doing stand up comedy. I did it for like this bit that I wanted to. T I, I made a part of my stand up comedy <laughs> act. But what yeah. happened was, is people started getting like real weird about it, and so I just I, I and and then I, I just kind of you know I people were like dicks to my family about it, and that's when I got oh, real. Uh, yeah. like people were like shitty to like friends, and there was a lot of like nasty gossip. So I, it kind of that kind of bummed me out. Was like how how um 
how, how, like, I thought it was like, I was doing all kinds of like crazy, funny shit after high school. Like I bullshitted my way onto this reality show that like, I, I just, part of my sense of humor has always been about pushing boundaries and yeah. doing things that are like deeply inappropriate. And I think I've mellowed out a little bit over the last <laughs> few years. Um, but that was something that I thought would be funny. And it was, <laughs> but, but people, people got real weird about it. It's actually like the story I told the fucking director of project X that got me the job. Like <laughs> I would not have gotten the movie without that. Um, I don't care if you put that on. I don't give a shit anymore, but, but, <laughs> but there was like a weird, like people, like you get into an argument with someone about some like bullshit and then they just bring it up to kind of throw it in your face. That's where I got real pissed about it. And, and I, and, yeah, people are dicks, you know, but, but, um, do I regret it? Not particularly. The only thing I regret is we live in internet world where people can like bring it up, like fucking like, you know, literally 12 years later as like a way to like, try to like get one on you. And it's like, yeah, yeah is, is that all, that's all you fucking got, you know, <laughs> but otherwise, no, I don't, I don't. Yeah. How'd you get oh, into it? No, I'm not, I'm not like, <laughs> looking, I'm not trying oh, I for made work. A bet. How no, no, I made, a, I made a bet. I made a bet with a couple of, um, I, I found like a Craigslist ad and, and I made a bet with a couple of my, I bet my friends 200 bucks. I, uh, they bet me to do it. And I thought, and, and so I did. That's it. <laughs> That's it. And like, I was like, you know, I was right out of high school. I was really bored at college. I was just starting to do stand up comedy. And I thought, um, I, I thought it would be funny. I can't believe anyone <laughs> would give you grief over that. Any guy I <laughs> did that, every, he would have been like a living legend. Well, Nobody it's, would have given because, it's because, well, first of all, it's because Americans are prude. Um, <laughs> Americans are super weird. Like you can, you know, they have no problem watching like someone's head get blown off on fucking YouTube. <laughs> but like you see some fucking dicks or tits and they, they fucking melt down. Um, <laughs> So that's like, it's a very specific American cultural phenomenon where people get mm. very weird about sex. Um, and to me, like, I've never had an issue with it. Like, I don't care. Like, if, if somebody like was like, hey, there's a nude scene in this acting job, would you like turn that down? I'd say, no, like, who gives a shit? Like, we all have fucking dicks. Who cares? <laughs> um, I mean, not all of us. I mean, <laughs> you, know, but, you know, the majority of men, uh, <laughs> the vast majority. You no, know, to me, it's it's like, you know, I, I don't I don't care. I, I don't care anymore. To me, it was like this weird, fun thing that I used to talk about on stage. And um, but then, like, like we were saying, culture and comedy really shifted and yeah. that became like kind of <laughs> unacceptable. And I think I think there will be a pushback. I think it's really weird how like there are no porn stars anymore. Like back when I was younger, like people who made porn were like famous and they mixed with like the mainstream entertainment industry. Like movie stars would date porn stars. In the 70s and the 60s, porn movies would play in fucking movie theaters. Like yeah. it was well, the, the, like, <laughs> and, and but now like porn, I don't know, Boogie Nights is one of my favorite movies. Also, <laughs> Thomas Anderson's The Master. But like with, with today, like, you don't even like see the name of the people you're jerking off to. It'll just be like <laughs> on Pornhub and it'll be like, first of all, there's way too much fucking incest shit. I hate that. You're like, <laughs> oh, no, but it's like guy bangs his stepsister. No, thank you. No, thank you. I'm keeping this shit away from my family. Um, but, but then like, they don't even like put their names on it. Like when I was like a kid, like people who made porn, like you, you knew their name. It was like, Oh, this is, this is Jenna Jameson or this is Ron Jer and like they made fuckloads of money and now just everybody kind of just makes their own and films it on their phone and it's like I don't know Ron the Jeremy internet was in Bruce Almighty. He was. <laughs> he, he showed up all over the place. I met that guy so there was this thing there was this this bar that's now closed in, in Burbank called Sardo's and every Wednesday they had this thing called porn star karaoke where all the famous <laughs> porn stars would show up and get fucking plastered and they're all <laughs> They were terrible singers, <laughs> but they just run around and sing and make out with each other. And the shit was hysterical. Like LA, LA is like, not so much right now, but LA, cause nobody's doing anything right now, but LA has probably gotta be one of the horniest cities in the world. <laughs> like there is so much, there is so much like just intense, open and that's, I think part of it is because of the entertainment industry and like everybody's just trying to sell their sexiness 
And, and I think part of it is just like, well, like, like we're very health conscious. And I think the reason that we're so health conscious is because we drive everywhere. We don't really have good public transportation. Yeah. So because we drive everywhere, like we have to be like, we have to like culturally focus on exercise and fitness. Otherwise we'd all be like fucking 700 pounds because we're sitting in our cars all day. I will say the nice thing about about uh, right now is there is no traffic. There's no traffic. <laughs> it's so easy. I can like a 45 minute drive would take me like 15 20 minutes right now. Um <sighs> but but uh no otherwise otherwise it kind of sucks out here. I don't <laughs> cuz cuz we're in a hot spot. So it's like all the restaurants and and bars and like gyms are starting to open and I'm like way too freaked out to go to any, like I'm a pussy. Like I'm like, I'm not, I, I gotta go see my 95 year old grandma. Like I, I don't want, like my biggest fear is, is like, I don't know. I've had a few friends get sick, but they're like totally fine. I just don't want to fucking, no. um, but wow. my hope is, is that in the quote unquote new world, we will see more comedy, like the kind of comedy we talked about today. If uh, you happen to get, your Project X remake made, we can shave our heads, be Russians. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, it's never, it's never going to happen. Like, X, X is done. I mean, maybe maybe there will be, like, a, you know, a retrospective. Like, a lot of times there are movies that critics hate, and then, like, you know, 15, 20 years later, people go, actually, the critics were wrong. But yes. um, I don't know. I think it's going to be a little while before people look back on that one. And it's cool that it's, but it's cool that it's stuck around. I'm glad that people yeah. like it. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you for giving us some of your time. Yeah, really thanks appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, Absolutely. Have a great day. And anytime you ever want to shoot the shit, hit me up. Yeah. Thank you. Sure, thanks, man, we'll do. Thank you.